committee will call the meeting to order for the afternoon of June 7th, 2022. Tony, will you call? Present. Present. Um, interpreter, you're on the wrong channel. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Mahan. Present. Jones, present. Present. Ricardo, present. Uh, we still have a... Yeah, I, I got it. Just give me a second. Okay. I'll fix it. All right. Uh, if you're able to stand, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, uh, today's invocation will be provided by Nicole Altamirano, uh, who uh, is a great member of our city team. And I know Councilmember Davis will tell us more, and I think we're going to do accommodation along with that. Is that right? Yeah, so we have the, the proclamation today. So if we could all, if we could come down and do the proclamation and then have Nicole do the, the invocation. Right. Gonna, would that be all right? This way, Nicole doesn't have to speak twice. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Councilmember Foley and me today to proclaim June as LGBTQ Pride Month. It's important that we as a city make everyone feel accepted and celebrate them for who they are. So this proclamation represents our love and welcoming of all San Jose residents who identify as LGBTQ+. I am so proud to be from a city that honors our LGBTQ plus community as much as we do with Trans Visibility Day, Trans Day of Remembrance, and Silicon Valley Pride Month. Thank you, Councilmember Foley, for recognizing these important days as well. It helps spread awareness and the urgency of an alliance with the LGBTQ plus community. Joining Councilmember Foley and me today to accept this proclamation is Nicole Altamarino from Silicon Valley Pride. Thank you, Nicole, for joining us. And First, I will let Councilmember Foley speak about this proclamation, and then Nicole is going to accept it and do the, do the invocation for us today. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. I'm Councilmember Pam Foley, and I represent District 9. But today, I speak loud and proud as an ally of the LGBTQ plus community. This proclamation represents the city's ongoing support of our LGBTQ plus community here and across the entire country. Today and every day, I stand alongside my colleagues and proudly give a voice to a community that other parts of our nation are trying to silence. Pride began as an event to acknowledge the Stonewall riots where members of the gay and trans community were victimized in New York over 50 years ago. This Pride Month, while our LGBTQ plus community celebrates the many freedoms they have fought hard to achieve, we acknowledge that those rights may be at risk. Our LGBTQ plus organizations have fought tirelessly for visibility, acceptance, and rights possessed by others, but they cannot do it alone. Straight allies like myself need to be louder and prouder than ever before to ensure that the city of San Jose remains a place where everyone is free to be who they are and free to love whomever they love. I wear my love is love mask in honor of my daughter, my brother, and all members of the LGBTQ plus community. Now that I stand, know that I stand and this council stands in solidarity with you, in support of you, in defense of you, and as your allies. Council Member Davis and I invite the public to celebrate Pride Month by joining us, us tonight at five o'clock at a flag raising, which we will do outside. There will be singing and dancing. With that, Mayor, will you present the recognition to Nicole Alt Aldemarano?
Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councilmember Davis and Foley, Mayor Sam Licardo, and all of the city council. I think uh, the council members spoke very wisely and said it best that, you know, we are very fortunate to be here in the Bay Area, to be here in the South Bay, to be here in San Jose, to have leaders that support us. But we would be remiss not to look at the rest of the country, the rest of the world, that don't openly and widely accept the LGBTQ plus population. And it is only that we are the most free as our most marginalized individuals, our most marginalized community members. So I implore all of you, city council, city leadership, members of the public, to be the best allies you can. And that, what that looks like is being an ally every day, to be safe for somebody to come out to, to have opening and welcoming policies, to be inclusive with your job applications, with your pronouns on the ends of email signatures, you know, including pronouns when you pick your gender, when you apply for a job. It makes people feel welcomed. It makes members of our LGBTQ plus community feel like, hey, I belong here. And that's important wherever we go. It's also looking, an ally is also standing up when maybe nobody is around. Well, there might not be a queer person here, but you hear a slur, you hear a joke, it's not that funny. Stand up and say something. And then most importantly, remember that pride was not born out of a need to celebrate, but rather a need and a determination to live authentically and to be ourselves in, in the face of discrimination, the face of persecution, that is why we are here today. We stand on the shoulders of the ones that come before us. So loud and proud, I say, happy Pride Month. Don't forget Silicon Valley Pride is at the end of August, August 27th and 28th. That's Silicon Valley Pride Month. But we celebrate year round and we're proud year round and we're so happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, I love the invocations where folks cheer. That's cool. Um, we'll go right into our second uh, ceremonial item. Councilmember Crosco is online, and uh, we're going to proclaim June as Immigrant Heritage Month. And if members of our community are here, please come on down. Great. Welcome. And Councilmember Crosco. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, there we go. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Was that Tony? Yes. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. And today is a, a special month. Uh, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Council Member Foley and Council Member uh, Davis uh, opened it up by proclaiming June Pride Month. Uh, and now it's uh, also Immigrant Heritage Month. Uh, so hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me today uh, as we proclaim also June as Immigrant Heritage Month. 31 days to celebrate the beautifully vibrant and diverse country that we are and the incredible people that have made it so. I challenge you to deny that immigrants are the backbone of the United States as we are a nation and valley built off their hopes, dreams, their drive and their accomplishments. Immigrants are courageous in their willingness to leave their homes everything that is of comfort and familiar to them in search of better opportunities or refuge in a new country. And it is because of their great sacrifice that we have accomplished much of our country's greatest victories and fueled our American spirit. Immigrants run our economies, working within every possible sector imaginable, from healthcare to community service, to caretaking, to food production and engineering, immigrants are are essential workers. Here in Silicon Valley, foreign-born workers make up for nearly half of the labor force as half of the major startups in San Jose were founded by immigrants from India, China, Taiwan. San Jose boasts one of the most diverse communities 
in the entire United States with one of the highest concentration of immigrants. Nearly 40% of San Jose residents are foreign born, a higher percentage than in Los Angeles and New York City. And we are proud that San Jose is home to such a collection of immigrant communities, such as the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam, a thriving Latino population, flourishing pockets of Portuguese and Filipino immigrants, and the third largest population of Indian Americans in the United States. This month is particularly special for those of us who are either immigrants or sons and daughters of immigrants. My parents immigrated from a very, very small little tiny town uh, in Mexico to the United States. They started their journey in Washington, DC, eventually making their way into California and uh, eventually uh, settling in San Jose following uh, that great technology of the assembly lines in the canneries and living uh, in, in very good paying jobs at, as cannery workers. We were able to buy a house. Eventually they were able to send their only daughter uh, to UC Santa Barbara. And I've told my team and I've told all of you, if you know Carrasco, we're probably related. I've estimated that there's about 22,000 Carrascos or descendants in the city of San Jose. And I've often thought that maybe I should have ran for uh, San Jose mayor. That's for another time. And what I saw reflected in, in immigrants and in all immigrants is uh, really that American spirit. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, this unifying spirit. We dedicate this month to honoring those who like my parents have experienced the long and hard process of immigration and since then achieving their American dream. Let's take the time to appreciate the impact that our immigrant populations have imparted upon all of us. Let's recognize their wisdom and their traditions and honor them by not turning a blind eye to the realities of our failed immigration system. Because let me remind, let me remind you all that the system is broken. There is no line to wait in. There is no timeline. And as elected officials, it is our duty to represent all our residents, regardless of immigration status. Our immigrant community is the foundation upon which we have built our nation and city. And as the 10th largest city in the United States, third largest in California, we need to be leaders in recognizing their contributions. I'm honored that we're joined by Yurina Guzman, an incredible cohort of leaders from both Luna and Papeles para Todos, or papers, documentation for all. Yurina Guzman was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco and achieved a nursing degree. She started like many immigrants, working in the fields, picking grapes in Paso Robles, and then working as a caregiver for the elders, el elderly. And for the last 10 years, working by cleaning homes. Yurina has stood with the immigrant community for many years and became involved in the Dreamers Movement in 2012. In 2017, she was invited to take part in the U Unity and Freedom Presidential Forum in Pasadena with Siren. That was where she learned the collective power of organizing and the movement. Yurina is now an organizer with Luna and Papeles para Todos, developing leaders so that our communities are educated and empowered by raising their voices and showing their collective power to make the necessary changes that benefit us all. And I'm grateful to be joined by folks leading the Papeles para Todos campaign. Papeles para Todos is a movement led by and for undocumented immigrants with the support of allies, which calls for citizenship for all 11 million undocumented immigrants in the country without exclusion, a halt to all deportations, the release of children at the border, the reunification of families, the closure of detention centers, the abolition of Migra or ICE, and that fight for a full recognition of all our civil democratic rights as migrant workers, including the right to vote, the right to an education, the right to fair salary, the right to housing, the right to healthcare, the right to retirement, and the right to travel the world freely with legal status and without discrimination. 
I want to thank you for your incredible work and dedication to serving our immigrant community, Yurina. Estoy increíblemente agradecida que has hecho tan gran esfuerzo y me quedo impresionada con el impacto de todo el trabajo que has hecho. Es mi gran honor today to proclaim June as Immigrant Heritage Month, and I'd love to have you say a few words. Mayor, if you don't mind. Um, muchas gracias, Concejal Carrasco. Otra vez, mi nombre es Yurina Guzmán y soy organizadora comunitaria con Luna. Okay. Um, interpreter, you're on the wrong channel. I don't, we don't need you to interpret back to us for this, for this. Yeah, we have, we have a person in person to translate for the speaker. Thank you. Soy organizadora comunitaria con Luna, Latinos Unidos por una Nueva América y orgullosa de ser parte del movimiento Papeles para Todos. Este movimiento que ha transformado a nuestras comunidades, elevando nuestras voces, empoderándonos y sabiendo que sí podemos realizar nuestros sueños juntos. La herencia inmigrante se celebra todos los días y cada minuto cuando nuestra comunidad sale a trabajar, que ni siquiera una pandemia mundial les pudo parar. Cuando al enfrentar, enfrentaron esta pandemia y no dejaron caer este país, las familias lo arriesgaron todo. Y mientras eso les traía muchas emociones pesadas como el miedo, el aislamiento, la tristeza y el desconcierto, también sabemos que nuestras vidas merecen ser celebradas. Cuando hablamos de una celebración, es una celebración de orgullo, de todo lo que somos capaces de transformar. Yo estoy orgullosa de la misión y la visión que Papeles para Todos ha creado juntos, en donde soñamos vivir en un mundo sin fronteras, donde las familias no sean separadas, donde nuestro color de piel no nos hace ir a las cárceles o ser las minorías. Estoy orgullosa de ser parte de un grupo donde creemos en nuestro poder colectivo, que podemos realizar nuestros sueños y recordando que somos residentes del mundo. Gracias a Papeles para Todos y de la mano de la Red de Respuesta Rápida que nos dieron entrenamiento y empoderamiento para parar las deportaciones y quitar a la migra de nuestras comunidades. Sabemos que la Red de Respuesta Rápida nació del amor que nuestra comunidad inmigrante tiene a sí misma. Celebro la valentía y el trabajo de todos en nuestra comunidad inmigrante que son tan esenciales para esto. Quiero que sigan fortaleciéndose con tanto amor, compasión y con coraje. En este momento la comunidad está luchando localmente por una vivienda digna, un sistema de transporte asequible para todos, por la justicia de ambiente, por un sistema de salud que nos proteja y que nos trate como seres humanos. Y por ser incluidos en la boleta para tener el derecho al voto local. Llamamos a todos dentro y fuera de esta comunidad a tomar acción de apoyo en estas luchas actuales que benefician a nuestra comunidad de inmigrante. Juntos podemos crear la ciudad que merecemos. Que viva la comunidad de inmigrante y que viva cada día y cada minuto para que este país siga brillando. Muchísimas gracias. Good afternoon. So I'm Gabriel Manrique, community organizer with Luna. I'm going to be translating uh, Yurina's statement. Hello, my name is Yurina, and I'm a community organizer with Luna in the Papeles para Todos movement. This movement has transformed our communities, raising our voices, empowering and knowing that we can achieve our dreams together. Immigrant heritage is celebrated every day, every minute. When our community goes out to work, not even a global pandemic can stop them. Being at the forefront, not letting this country fall. The families risk it all, and while that brings many heavy emotions, fear, isolation, sadness, and bewilderment, we also know that our lives deserve celebration. When we talk about celebration, it is a celebration of pride and all that we are capable of transforming. I am proud of the mission and vision that Papeles para Todos has built together, where we dream of living in a world without borders, where we fight to close detention centers, where there are no separated families, where our skin, of, our skin color does not make us go to prisons or be minorities. I am proud to be part of a group where we believe in our collective power that we can make these dreams come true. 
Let us remember that we are residents of the world. Thanks to Papeles Para Todos, hand in hand with the Rapid Response Network that gave us training and empowerment to stop deportations and remove migra from our communities. We know that the Rapid Response Network was born out of the love that our immigrant community has for itself. I celebrate the bravery, bravery and work of all in our immigrant community that are so essential for this to continue to grow stronger with so much love, compassion, and courage. Right now, the community is fighting locally for decent housing, affordable transport, transportation for all, environmental justice, a healthcare system that protects us and treats us like human beings, and to be included on the ballot to have the right to vote. We call everyone inside and outside our community to take action supporting these current struggles that benefit our immigrant community. Together, we can create the city we deserve. Long live the immigrant community. Gracias, Irina. Un abrazo. I thank you for the members of the community who came out uh, to support both of those presentations. Uh, we're going to go on to orders of the day. I'm going to ask if anyone in the council has changed the printed agenda. I know that Council Member Peralta would like to adjourn today's meeting in memory of Tang Do, who passed away on May 8th uh, at the age of 62. Um, Council Member Foley indicated desire to adjourn it. 4.50 p.m., and I'm going to suggest that we adjourn completely at that time, uh, given the fact that we've got a lot of folks, I know, on the dais who need to be in lots of places on Election Day. So uh, we'll try to get through as much as we can today. Hopefully we'll get through all of it. Uh, if we're, we're all succinct enough. Okay. Uh, and any other changes to orders? Okay. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Council member, should we go first to the adjournment or would you like to call roll? Um, go ahead, Tony. Call roll. Go ahead, Tony. Jimenez. Present. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is for voting. This is actually the vote. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Morales. Yes. Voting Cohen. Roll. Aye. Carrasco. Aye. Davis. Yes. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Prowl. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, today's meeting will be adjourned in the honor of Thangdo. And I want to say thank you to his family members who are joining us virtually. Uh, and thank you to them for allowing me uh, to offer up this adjournment. <laughs> Thangdo passed away on May 8th at the age of 62. It's an honor to recognize him for his continued advocacy of our downtown here in San Jose, uh, being a nationally recognized architect and for being a Vietnamese American community leader. Thang was a refugee who fled from Vietnam in 1975. He supported himself through college where he earned his degree in architecture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo College of Architecture and Environmental Design. Thong was the CEO of District 3 based ADIS Architecture, chair of the San Jose Planning Commission, and was a co founding member of the progressive Vietnamese American organization Pivot. He also founded Sofa Market, an urban food hall in our San Jose's emerging sofa, dis sofa art district, as well as the Fountainhead Bar, an architecture themed bar located within. Thong was also the lead architect 
in the first of its kind Vietnamese American Services Center on Tolly Road, a project he called a milestone of his career. Through his various roles over the years, Tung always did everything with a big heart and worked hard to uplift our city and our community. He is survived by his wife, Grace, and his four children, Min, Lin, An, and Bao. And I know many of his family and friends gathered to celebrate him this past Sunday at the Municipal Rose Garden. I know personally uh, he will be missed by many, uh, by me included. I was blessed to meet him when I first ran and won for city council eight years ago and, uh, and after my wife and I became regulars there at the Sofa Market and the Fountainhead Bar. He was a tremendously positive person always very uplifting to me and to others. Uh, and I wanna say thank you, Mayor, for including in your, your recently released budget message, um, the idea of funding for a memorial. Um, again, I know that, that I will miss him, many will miss him, um, but his impact and his legacy will forever be remembered by our community here. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Councilmember Pross. Um, our love and support goes to Grace and the family, and uh, I know he leaves many, many friends. Uh, he had such a, a deep and wide impact in our community. All right. With that, we will move forward to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. All right. Uh, next up is the consent calendar. Are there any items that the council would like to pull from consent. I have a note indicating Councilmember Sparza would like to pull item 2.19, which are actions related to the Second Street Studios. Are there other okay. items yeah. to be pulled? I'm just pulling up the screen now. I don't see any of my colleagues' yeah, hands. Sorry. Oh, Councilmember Davis, forgive yeah, me. Yeah, 2.32. 2.32, okay. Any other items to be pulled? Okay, why don't we go first then to Council Member Esparza on item 2.19. Again, this is actions related to Second Street Studios. Council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I, I support uh, the what's in the report. I. Uh, just wanted to add a couple of things to it. Uh, Renaissance Place is in District 7, and I have been working with the county um, on, uh, for example, some security assessments um, and some security enhancements um, at Renaissance Place. And so I wanted to ask housing, um, did, uh, did Second Street Studios get similarly get a security assessment from the county security office or the sheriff's office? Rachel's making her way down. Uh, you're probably okay. Going to see that. Thanks. She's, she's coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Councilmember Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy mm -hmm. Director of the Housing Department. So we did have a security assessment completed by the city of San Jose's police department. So in this case, we worked with the city versus the county sheriff's office, um, but that was actually um, completed. And the information from that assessment was, um, was basically incorporated into the improvements that we're recommending for the property. Okay, um, I, I had spoken to, uh, who at the PD did that? I don't have the name with me right now, um, but there was an assessment completed at the property. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm wondering who that was because I, uh, this uh, Second Street Studios and Renaissance Place are in the same police division. And I had reached out to the captain of that division. He was completely unaware of uh, SJPD security assessment. So, um, so I would, 
because I think we're trying to coordinate a lot more with the county on permanent supportive housing developments and uh, emerging needs, um, I think we benefit from, uh, from that coordination. Uh, the county is moving forward on developing processes for all permanent supportive housing developments. Um, and at Renaissance Place, for example, the Sheriff's Office conducted a security assessment in partnership or with in coordination with the SJPD. And so um, I, uh, I think that we should sort of establish that as a baseline for all the permanent supportive housing developments um, in our city. And so I just, I saw that security enhancement and I'm assuming that's a supplement to the system that's already there, right? It's not replacing it, but it's adding. Yes, that's correct. It's adding to the existing security that is already on site. Okay, so um, I, uh, because of uh, the county being more proactive um, on permanent supportive housing developments, um, security, I, I'd uh, like to move to approve uh, this, uh, approve 2.19, but add that we coordinate um, with uh, the uh, county for security assessment um, because it, there may be some other things as happened in Renaissance Place. There were some other um, additional needs beyond cameras that came out of that security assessment um, that Second Street Studios could benefit from. So um, I'd like to move to approve 2.19 um, and, and um, add a uh, county security assessment. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, we have one member of the public, I believe, who wanted to speak on this item. Oh, their hand may have just gone down because yeah. they want to speak on a different item. Okay, Rachel, while you're there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had another question for you. Um, I, I understand that some of this money is actually helping to fix some challenges with plumbing and, and leaks. And I had heard rumors that there are particular challenges with the prefabricated uh, nature of the construction. Is that something we see in other uh, prefabricated, pro I know we don't have a lot of prefabricated projects. Um, I know this, I think this was the first, if I'm not mistaken. Is this something we're seeing or we think we're gonna see more universally or was there something unique here? Um, thank you, Mayor, for your question. This is something that we have been asking ourselves and also we're asking um, the um, providers of modular housing, right? Because um, we have run into, I mean, the challenge that we've had on the site is that, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, a couple stories tall. So let's say that there's a flood on the third floor. Um, there's just this, it just soaks all the way down to the bottom, like right through the other floors and has um, just been a challenge for us because the water intrusion runs very quickly. And so um, that part of, you know, this investment is to really seal things up and to um, also put in safeguards so that the water doesn't run, like we don't have to like shut the water off automatically right. as well. So those are all things that we will definitely be looking at in future developments. Um, but also the, just the, the situation where the water tends to just run right down through the different floors. Yeah. That is something that we are um, specifically looking into as we're exploring modular housing in the future. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to know just because we don't have very many examples, Yeah. but we do want to ask the question ahead of time because we are learning through this experience that, that it has been a common problem. Okay, thank you. And I know we have other multi-story modular projects. I'm thinking about Monterey Branham, which I think is now in Council Member of Men's District. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I hope that we can apply lessons learned. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Jimenez? Yeah, just a, just a question. I'm supportive of the motion. I, what I'm curious about is there's a particular, I'm pulling up the memo, but there's a particular amount that we're approving or up to a particular amount, I guess. Assuming we do, well, when we do the additional assessment with the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, assuming other things are found that are gonna cost more money, do you think, I mean, is it, or can you accommodate that within the direction that's given, the approval that's given, or are you gonna have to come back or how does that work? Um, that's a good question. We are requesting today approval for $1 million in addition to the existing loan. So it basically will grow the loan by a million dollars. 
um, I think that that is there. There may be some room in that budget to to move things around. Obviously, we put it together with specific projects in mind, um, and so we can assess that. Um, if we do feel that we need additional authority, then um, we will come back to council if we think that's necessary. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, let's. Mayor, I just wanted to add something. I, I raised oh, my hand, I just lowered it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add that um, I. I think that all the permanent supportive housing developments in our city can kind of benefit by this coordination. Um, at Renaissance Place, um, the county is actually going to be uh, paying for some security enhancements. And so, you know, sometimes it might be us, sometimes it might be the county, but um, I, so hopefully, I don't know if that addresses Councilmember Jimenez's questions as, as well, but I do think that, um, we can continue to coordinate as we bring more developments online. And that's it for me. All right, thank you. Uh, Jackie, do you wanna jump in? Um, so I just wanted to clarify in the past who we've had do these inspections. So, um, because we have done them in other sites as well. And the inspections have been done by the uh, specialized unit in this uh, police department that actually does security uh, work with us and has done like safety meetings and other kinds of protocols where they've walked buildings and provided uh, insight into the types of repairs we should we could do. And I suppose one of the things if you could give us some flexibility is instead of having us come back if there would be and um, if it is based on this assessment that you all feel that you're supporting, then it would be helpful if you give us a little latitude to go a little bit above the amount so that we would not have to return. That would actually be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I was gonna mention that when I was asking my question, but I, but I figured just the, the sense I got is that you'd be able to accommodate that. But I, I don't know if there's like a magic number, but I, I'd propose a friendly amendment to, to Council Member Esparza's uh, move to recommend. Uh, I guess Jackie or, or Rachel, what if we're asking if the additional sort of loan is a million dollars, is it a million one hundred thousand dollars? Is it, I mean, what, what, I'm trying to understand how much more you need. 1.1, 1 1.2 1 would, 1.2 up to that right it isn't okay so so council member Esparza, I, I i'd be curious if you'd be willing to entertain a motion to give um increase the threshold of the loan essentially to accommodate any anything that may arise during the course of the uh the assessment that you're asking for that's a great idea yeah absolutely um and uh and um yeah and uh, and then I just wanted to clarify, I think that position at SJPD, the, uh, what is it called? Um, can Crime someone prevention. remind me? It's the enhanced design, uh, security through enhanced design, something like that. That's been vacant for several years. So anyway, um, uh, I think that's a great idea, Council Member Jimenez, I'm happy to accept that. Thanks. Good, and I'm, I'm not sure who the seconder was. I don't, I don't think it was Pam. I think it was Council Member Foley. Did I'll I hear it correctly? It. Sure, I'll accept yeah. it. Oh, I, I can't. All right. And, and the only other thing I would say that comes to mind as it relates to this is that uh, I think that I, I'd be curious how the housing department or how we, or how you, Councilmember Esparza, would approach a situation in which the county sheriff's office uh, maybe has different and distinct recommendations from the police department and how that may sort of play out. But uh, I'm not sure what you've seen on the ground, but that's something I think I'd be curious about and to the extent it plays out in this situation be interested to know that offline yeah um and I, i'll add uh we can talk more online but as the county has already approved it um uh they had a public discussion because of our experiences at renaissance place um the county is creating a position within their security office um to to be a li liaison um on security issues uh for developments just to address some unique needs and to coordinate with the different security companies and um just things like that and so uh i 
believe that position was approved, but it hasn't been filled yet. Um, but to basically so that we can coordinate much more. But yeah, the good questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilman Frost. Yeah, just uh, um, I think I'm, I'm happy with with uh, what's being proposed, but I think to try to clarify, I, I don't know if it's it's the case, but is uh, Renaissance Place when somebody from that uh, a resident there calls in 911, are are county sheriffs dispatched for that? Is that why they were they were involved? I don't know. No, if you know that, so. Yeah. No, uh, so when a uh, resident calls 911, it's uh, the police and San, San Jose police and fire that responds. Um, it's a county uh, facility, it's on county land, and the contracts with the property manager, with the nonprofit service providers um, are with the county. And so um, uh, the county had uh, come out and done that security assessment. Uh, for their property, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because I just I know that we did not at all have the county involved with our uh, not only the security assessment, but literally for the last couple of years, at least not the county sheriffs. I should say to be specific. So we didn't have the county sheriffs involved. We were working through the the unit that you were describing, Jackie, as crime prevention, the crime prevention unit, and um, that's the only unit that we currently have within San Jose PD right now that would do this kind of assessment. Um, and uh, we did coordinate though with our captain, but it was crime prevention uh, that came out, which is actually a, a civilian based unit out of the PD. Um, and so that's, so anyways, it was kind of news to me that maybe the sheriffs would be involved. It makes sense though, because Renaissance Place, as you just described, Councilmember Esparza, um, what's more unique there is that that is county owned um, land. And so that would potentially be why maybe the, the sheriffs were more involved there, but if they can provide a, a additional perspective, um, certainly happy to, to, to hear that, right? And, and to see how that uh, could help and then vice versa with, you know, getting crime prevention or, or somebody from the PD out to, to, to help at Renaissance Place. Um, the, you know, the, the more professional eyes, uh, the better. Thanks. Yeah, and I, and again, you know, because this is something that has, we've been working on at Renaissance Place, um, as we bring more facilities online, I think that there's an opportunity to uh, really, again, sort of coordinate more with the county because police respond, fire responds, right? Um, and uh, to coordinate with the county and, um, and, you know, I think we're all continuing to learn as we bring more um, developments online. And, and I do think that one of the things that we have learned is uh, Renaissance Place is one of the largest in the country, and so is Second Street Studios. These are two of the largest permanent supportive housing developments in the country. And so we've learned a lot as a city and a county, um, and hopefully we can coordinate more and then sort of standardize some processes so that uh, residents from the developments and providers don't have to figure it out on their own in each development. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Anything further on this item? Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lizardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next item, I believe, is 2.32. Uh, Councilman Davis would like to speak. This is uh, my request for travel authorization. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's your request for a travel authorization to Qatar. And I just I want to talk a little bit about it because I know that there have been uh, charges of human rights violations um, from Amnesty International and as well as the U U.S. State Department uh, against Qatar. So I'm concerned about uh, you going there <laughs> because they, there are charges that their migrant workers continue to face labor abuses and struggle to change jobs freely, as well as uh, there being curtailment of freedom of expression increasing in the run-up to the FIFA World Cup 2022. In addition, women and LGBTQ plus people continue to face discrimination both in law and in practice. So we're celebrating Pride Month today and 
uh, we're celebrating the freedom in our, in our country and our city for the LGBTQ plus community. And Qatar is just at odds with our values. And so I just, I, I understand that this, the state of Qatar is paying for your travel. And I'm wondering what their motives are for inviting all of these U US mayors through the mayor's conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Davis. I, uh, I submitted a memorandum, I think, that discussed some of these issues, though clearly a one-page memorandum wouldn't be enough. There's no question uh, that, for example, Qatar retains elements of Sharia law uh, in their legal system. So there are many areas where I think we would all agree uh, we don't agree with what Qatar is doing in its own country. Uh, on the other hand, Qatar has been uh, something of a beacon in many ways within the context, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the Saudi Arabia Peninsula where it is located, uh, in many ways. For example, uh, women got the right to vote at the same time men did in 1998. Obviously, it's not a democracy in the same way any of us would characterize a democracy in the West. Uh, but it is constitutional emirate, and there is a right to vote, uh, and there is some democratic participation. Uh, for example, the right to run for office among women, for example, other kinds of things which separate Qatar from, uh, from other nations, though clearly we would all agree they have a long way to go. Um, President Biden uh, spoke with the Emir Qatar on January 31st. 2022. Uh, and I, I just pulled this up and I'll just read a, a, a few words of President Biden's. He referred to the 50 years of partnership between the two countries. Um, and referred to Qatar, as, uh, Qatar rather, as a good friend and a reliable and capable partner. Uh, I'm notifying Congress I'll designate Qatar as a major non-NATO ally to reflect the importance and the importance of our relationship. It's long overdue. Uh, and specifically, uh, his praise referred to their efforts in the Qatar being central to many of our most vital interests. Uh, this is again President Biden relocating tens of thousands of, of Afghan, maintaining stability in, in Gaza, providing life-saving life assistance to the Palestinians, keeping pressure on ISIS, and deterring threats across the Middle East, and a lot more. Uh, so this is a nation that has been an ally of the United States in many, many uh, challenging uh, uh, contexts, uh, particularly in helping to oppose more autocratic regimes in other parts of the region. Uh, they are interested, from what I can tell, uh, based on what's been communicated to me, uh, in having elected officials from throughout the United States uh, come in advance of the World Cup, which they are hosting, of course, for the entire planet. Uh, that's the biggest sports event in the world, I would imagine. Uh, I guess it's either first or second with the Olympics. Uh, and uh, they would like to ensure that more people have an opportunity uh, to be able to see what the country is about. Uh, I know that uh, there are uh, certainly economic interests they have. Obviously, I won't be spending any public dollars uh, in Qatar. Uh, I'm happy to ensure that whatever is spent uh, for me to get there, for example, by Uber, I'll pay for myself. Uh, this will be entirely paid for uh, by the foreign ministry. And they're flying several other mayors out as well. Uh, Mike Dugan, for example, the mayor of uh, Detroit, uh, the last year's president of the U.S. Mayor's Conference, Brian Barnett, there, there are a few of us that are on the trip. Uh, let me just briefly refer to the points that I made in the memorandum, which was submitted here um, with this item. Uh, as I mentioned, that Qatar is a constitutional emirate. It draws a substantial portion of its legal structure from Islamic law, so one does not expect to find American-style legal protections for women's rights, for religious expression, or for that matter, LGBT community, or many other uh, areas where we would insist on those protections. Um, Yet the country has become an increasingly prominent ally of the West, demonstrating leadership among Arab Muslim nations for social, educational, and economic opening. Uh, it is the home of the Al Jazeera Media Group, 
which has promoted greater transparency throughout the Arab world. It houses six prominent American universities. Uh, Qatari women enjoy far greater progress in voting rights, political leadership, education, and career than their peers in neighboring nations. And it has a recent history of actively opposing autocratic governments in nations such as Libya, Sylvia Bahrain, and has hosted negotiations to resolve longstanding disputes among warring parties in Afghanistan. Uh, we know that the nature of engaging in any way uh, with other nations, nations is one in which uh, our agreements are going to be far from complete. Uh, and if we're traveling uh, in the Middle East in particular, we're going to have a very difficult time finding nations uh, whose civil liberties, records on civil liberties and other kinds of legal protections are anything we would consider anywhere near uh, acceptable by our own American standards. Uh, nonetheless, if we don't communicate, if we don't travel, then we won't learn. Uh, I'm going to speak to my own motivation, uh, particularly because I'm focused on water, and I know that they have made uh, great gains in, uh, around uh, providing a potable supply for their 3 million residents, uh, utilizing some of the kinds of technology uh, we would like to be deploying ourselves, uh, including uh, potable reuse uh, and desalination, including uh, some technologies related to desal, uh, which I'm told uh, are significantly better environmentally and a lower cost. Obviously voted to restrict city travel to American cities for, for less than uh, the abuses that, that have been leveled against, uh, or allegations that have been leveled against Cotter. So I'm not, I'm not going to support this request. I think there, there isn't a pressing need for, for this trip. And again, I, I find it really just disconcerting that it's happening during, during Pride Month. And I, I agree that FIFA World Cup, um, event is a very big event, but there is always a lot of controversy in the locations that, that FIFA chooses. And this, this one in particular has for years had many, many issues. So um, I, I just can't support this. Thank you. We have two members of the public would like to speak. Tony? Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item and speaking about it uh, publicly. I mean, this is a learning experience for myself too. I know that the mayor of Berkeley just recently visited uh, Israel and there was a lot of controversy with that as I think we can all be pretty uh, not too happy with the way Israel is acting towards Palestine at this time. And, and, uh, and Israel is fighting for such a, uh, you know, separate, separatist state and way to work that I think it's really frustrating to all of us at this point. I can see people not wanting the mayor of Berkeley to, to visit uh, Israel, but he did. And I, what the mayor said, there is something to traveling and learning. And it sounds like some channels can be opened up. Not everyone is going to be bad within the country, as within all countries, some are good and some are bad. It's, uh, it's a judgment on ourselves, you know, can we bring out, can we draw out our better principles and our better ideals in such travels? And so I, good, I wish a good luck in the mayor in bringing those principles out and bringing out our good, good beliefs. And uh, we're at a time to begin to do that again and ask those sort of questions and to be really firm in our beliefs and at the same time ask what, what is interchange, what is dialogue. And so uh, good luck in that process. And um, I deal with the same issues, you know, all the work I do with openness and accountability. This work possibly may have originally derived from UAE ideas. And I've, I've, I'm a bit uncomfortable with UAE, UAE ideas sometimes. And so it, I go back and forth on the issue myself as well. Uh, so just an overall good luck and just understanding world cultures. And uh, it's a good learning process for us all, hopefully. Thank you. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders. Um, I'm, I'm glad this has been brought up and I do think it's an opportunity for all of us to learn something. 
Um, so, Mayor, I would just say that if you go, if the vote is in favor of you going and you go, I would ask um, respectfully that when you're there and you are learning that any time you see a woman um, who's in a position of, of any kind of power or authority or in a room that you might seek her opinion and, and ask her um, because women need the authorization of men to speak there and to give their opinion in certain circumstances. I find that if you take that leadership position there in asking a woman her opinion on a matter, I think that that will go a long way to setting an example for how we here um, live and care about women. Me speaking, for example, right now, um, I'm just so proud to say that I do live in a country where I have this right and I don't have to ask my husband in the other room for his permission. So please um, seek out the opportunity anywhere you can to acknowledge the women that are around you. Thank you. Ruthie Callahan. Hi, Ruth Callahan, sorry for the delay. Um, I'd just like to say that I support what uh, Council Member Davis said very eloquently. There's no reason to go to this meeting. Um, it's just a, a waste of time in our city's money and you really won't be representing us the way we actually feel about Qatar, their position in the world and how they comport themselves on the national on the global stage. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. And just to clarify for the record, I won't be expending any of the city's money. Uh, Councilmember Prost. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anybody else traveling with you from like a delegation of the city or no, just you? Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm paying for my wife to go with me, uh, but no, no one's going from the city. Okay. M my concern is sort of to the, I guess what Councilmember Davis's last statement was on, on just sort of the, the value of being able to, to bring something back that then is potentially implementable on, on what you're saying, like right, what you may be able to learn in some of the energy uh, work that they're doing there, desoundization as you put in, um, I think obviously very important things to learn, but not necessarily something that would require a, a, a trip to Qatar and maybe one that might bene be beneficial to some of our city staff. Um, and considering that you're, you're, you're terming out at the end of the year here, the opportunity I think for some of that information to reside here with the city, I, I do think that there is some, some importance to that. So, and I was looking up in a quick Google search, it looks like uh, this, the uh, Qatar is utilizing the U.S. Conference of Mayors to invite m literally hundreds of mayors from across the country. Um, and, and so they've been doing that since uh, the beginning of the year. Um, and so I, that is a, a little bit concerning as well that maybe um, there's, there's obviously something in it, uh, I think for them in, in regards to that, that PR aspect or the relationship building. And, um, and I would agree that it, it, it's not so much about the money, it's more about the, the optics of, of what it is to, you know, to have that type of relationship. Um, and I don't know if there is a, uh, a value we'll be able to, to add directly for our city, especially if there's not gonna be like senior staff or somebody traveling with you. I've seen some of these other mayors travel with, whether it's their city manager or, or other sort of staff. So I, I don't know if that was part of the invitation, but I actually think that would be slightly more valuable, right? To have somebody from um, city staff that might um, be working in some of these areas. So um, if you want to respond. Yeah, the uh, flight's on Thursday, so I think the likelihood of us being able to get somebody to get on the plane is slim. I have no idea if they'd pay for it or not. I could find out. They didn't invite, they, they was just, the invitation was just for you then. Uh, I, you know, I can't speak to what the invitation would be. I could go back and find out, but I have no idea if they would allow for city staff to join. Okay. I, I wasn't going to have city staff go on city expense. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate, um, you know, I think the, the interest here, but I, I, I will not support it either. Thanks. Okay. All right. Is there a motion? So move. Uh, actually, let me just ask is the entire um, consent calendar, uh, Vice Mayor, does that include the consent? Yes, it can. Yes. All right. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. 
let's vote. This is the entire consent calendar. I have my hand raised. I have. My oh, hand I'm sorry. Raised. Forgive me, yeah. Councilmember Reyes. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Thank you. I'm uh, equally as concerned, and I I want to thank you, uh, Councilmember Davis, for bringing this up. I think it creates awareness of um, human rights and especially um, gender rights. Um, it's very scary, I think, for the women who are living there, despite maybe some progress. Um, I don't know that their role um, in society is what um, we would honor um, in any place of the world. Um, and so to have a member of our council and our, or, and our, or our mayor um, go there in that role is something that I am not a, um, I'm not going to be able to support. I think when I went to Japan, there was a lot of criticism because um, there is a number of us going and uh, Sister Cities obviously has a, a um, purpose. It is very structured. It has uh, an exchange of ideas that has been prepared ahead of time. Uh, the interest of this country is unknown. Um, and I think it's uh, a slippery slope and the fact that this memo is coming two days before um, departure um, is, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know, you know, I don't know what to say to that, but I, I'm just not going to um, support this. As a woman, I think I, we have such difficulty to be honored here in our own council. Um, and to deal with um, the difficulty of, of being a woman of color, being a woman, the mansplaining that sometimes has happened on the dais. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do um, in our, within our own culture. And uh, the country that you are going to is, is a place where I would be so scared um, to travel to. So, I am going to not um, support this. Thank and, you. Uh, and, and my question is, why, why is it that um, you need approval for the city? If this, this sounds like this is a personal trip and you're using yeah. your funds. Why not just go on your own without the city? Sure, and perhaps I can explain briefly also uh, about the timing. Uh, I learned about this opportunity about two weeks ago. Uh, so that's why we're having it come to the council now. And uh, the council would need to authorize what is essentially a gift, which is the cost of the travel that is paid for by the foreign ministry. Uh, so that is the council's role. Is that right, Nora? Um, thank you, Mayor. Yes, it's a gift to the city. And so that's why it needs council approval. Oh, okay. Well, this is one gift I'd like to send back um, to the sender. Uh, Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, Foley. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and first I wanna thank Council Member Davis for bringing this uh, to our attention, but I'd like to request a friendly, friendly amendment of the vice mayor. And that is that we pull this from the consent calendar and, uh, and we uh, it be bifurcated and we vote on it separately. I, I was gonna make that same. Okay. Comment. So. Okay, the motion's bifurcated. Thank you. Right. Would you like to speak on it? Okay. All right. Uh, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Councilmember Foley and uh, the Vice Mayor for bifurcating that. Um, I, I, you know, especially given the item that we're going to discuss uh, later today, uh, you know, women continue to face discrimination in law and practice, according to um, Amnesty International's assessment of Qatar, that under the guardianship system, women remain tied to their male guardian, usually their father, brother, grandfather, uncle, or for married women to their husband. Women continue to need their guardian's permission for key life decisions to marry, study abroad on government scholarships, work in many government jobs, travel abroad until certain ages, and receive some forms of reproductive health care. So I, um, I agree. Uh, I, uh, you know, normally I, 
am the first in line to thank the mayor for his advocacy on our on behalf of our city, but I, I just can't do it this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, any other comments? All right, let's first vote on the motion as to item 2.32, and then we'll vote on the remainder of the consent calendar. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take uh, separately, we'll take public comment on the rest of the consent calendar. Okay, uh, Tony. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? I don't think we got a motion on this one separately, did yes, we? Yes, it, it was okay. to approve. Sorry, no. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Roscoe? Oh, no. Davis? No. Esparza? No. Arenas? No. Foley? No. Mahan? No. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Motion fails four to seven. Okay, let's go to the rest of the consent calendar. We have one member of the public would like to speak. Speakman. Hi, uh, Brad Beekman here to speak on the remaining uh, consent calendar items. Um, you have one item that uh, there's a pr approval of uh, basic uh, city budget maintenance functions for 2022 and 23. Good luck in how that can be the ideas of equity that I know we're really trying to figure. There can be a baseline of equity services that I hope this sort of item can be addressing. And good luck to cost of living expenses ideas and how that doesn't have to tie into the future of uh, uh, rate increases for uh, rents each year. Uh, that, that's a, that, I, that has to be really controlled and they're trying to do that in Oakland right now. Good luck how San Jose can work on that as well. The remaining items, I think uh, can, I can relate to uh, the items talked about at a transportation committee meeting yesterday. You have some items uh, about the uh, about the future of uh, 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 pedestrian bridge, you know, pedestrian and bicycle services and stuff, and that that relates to uh, we need good statistic taking in the next few years. We can't be lying about our statistics. We have to be really honest about it. And good luck in those efforts. How our statistics for you know data collection for pedestrian and bicycle projects in our future can be open and accountable, and that whole process can go well towards openness and accountability. It's an important concept or it's peace that we have to be learning for ourselves. And uh, with my remaining time, the uh, final item about uh, community energy uh, renewal contracts and uh, contracts with the future of uh, fossil fuel groups. Good luck in those efforts. Good luck how we can really talk about what is carbon neutral. Carbon neutral features the ideas of nuclear fuel. How can we talk about renewable energies and our good California plans we've started now? Um, we accidentally put Brian Darby's hand down, so we're calling on Brian Darby. Okay, can you hear me? Brian, you out there? Yeah, can you hear me okay? You're unmuted, and I think I've faintly heard you. No, I can't hear you. Let's see. There you go. We can hear you a little bit, Brian. You talk okay, a little louder. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, and I don't need my time back. It's only take a few minutes. I agree with Mr. Beekman. If we could do the um, when we when we consolidate all the data as far as bikes and you know alternative transportation, really get an accurate count. That would be really helpful in planning, and that's a student or a student that. This, the public can have access to it too. Thank you. Giovanni. Hi, since we're speaking about stuff in the planning, uh, I was just like concerned about the uh, eliminating of the fossil fuels too. No, and sorry, Giovanni, this, we're talking about items on the consent calendar. Um, if oh. you want to talk about fossil fuels, you can do that during open forum. Okay. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, thank you. Back to the council on the consent calendar. There is a motion from again from Vice Mayor. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? 
Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Uh, aye. Thank you. All right. On to item 10.1, which is the land use consent calendar, distinguished from the consent calendar we just voted on. So move approval. Motion. Second. Council Member Foley. I would actually like to pull 10.1C as I have a question. Okay. <coughs> Can I ask my question? Please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. This has to do with the uh, Indian Health Center and uh, the questions I have is uh, while this seems like a, a great use of the property and an expansion of their service, there has been a long-term difficulty with parking of the employees in the residential neighborhoods. And I'm wondering if the health clinic has uh, a plan for how to address preventing employees or others from parking in the residential streets so that some of the residents who are old, older cannot park in front of their houses. We've been getting a lot of emails about that. Do we have any input as to what they might be doing, how they might be able to mitigate some of that parking concerns? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Robert Manford, Deputy Director for Planning. Yes, we did coordinate with the applicant and he made changes to their operational plans. And I believe they are online and they'll be able to kind of uh, go over that with us. Okay, can you share with me what they are? I haven't, I haven't seen those yet. Yes, or that would be helpful. I, I believe they have actually uh, told their employees not to park on the streets, and they've also educated them in, the, in terms of the DOT or the parking enforcement, providing, giving them tickets when they do so. They've also been talking to the, uh, the residents of the area, indicating that those who park on the streets are not from them, but there's another medical office building in there that the employees do so, but it's actually not their employees. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of medical buildings around there, sure. I'm, I'm sure it's probably not just them. Yeah, okay, correct. thank you very much. That answers my question. Okay, any other questions? All right, we are going to go to public comment on all the land use consent. So, Mr. Beekman. No, nope, not Mr. Mr. Beekman. I've got. Oh, you got it. Okay, here we go. Yes, yeah, so we're going to start with the in-person speakers. Um, I'm going to call all four names. Come down in no particular order. As soon as you hear a name, come down to the microphone. The rest of you line up um, on the stairs behind the first person who gets here. I have Raimundo, Espinoza, it looks like, Sonia, Gerardo, and Aegean. So first person, go straight to the microphone. Everybody else continue to come down and just line up on the stairs. So again, that's Raimundo, Sonia, Gerardo, and Aegean. I might not be pronouncing your names correctly. Go ahead. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Sonia Tetnowski, the CEO of the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I, I, I appreciate that this item had concerns with the community members and we have worked closely, provided forums for them to speak to us. We also gave them options as far as what we had done about it and this was prior to COVID. And we've implemented all the things that we told them we would do. We now rent spaces from other businesses around us. We have a third of our staff working from home at this point. And so the amount of staff on site is smaller than it's been actually prior to COVID. And so I feel like um, IHC has made a good faith effort to address all the concerns, provide the feedback and um, be able to uh, ensure that the work that we're doing in the community is valued and respectful of our neighbors. Um, honestly, I feel like the uh, request for a stationary permit doesn't quite fit into our needs. We'd like our mobile vehicle to be mobile and not stationary, uh, but because we don't fit into that specific um, ordinance, 
we had to request a special use permit, and that's the reason why it's on this, under this line item. Honestly, the, the, I would appreciate if the council would consider just giving us a letter stating that no zoning is required, and then we can get our permit from the California State Department of Health so that we can be mobile throughout the city. That's our goal. We wanna be able to inreach in the community, provide services to our um, unhoused community. And we know that we have a lot more than we've ever had before. So bringing services to them rather than making them come to our facility would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and, and City Council members. My name is Raimundo Espinosa. I'm the CEO of Gardner Health Services, and we provide services to about 43,000 individuals throughout uh, Santa Clara County, providing medical, dental, optometry, health care to the homeless services throughout uh, this county. Um, I, I'm kind of concerned because I think this is a, uh, this is a false narrative. You're, fo you're focusing on parking when the reality is that this mobile unit will go to people who need help, and they'll go to the most needy individuals that need help, and they will try to get them to where they need to be. That's the purpose, and that's what we learned from the pandemic, that our organizations are, have the ability to get to those high-need populations and get them help and sometimes get them into housing, sometimes get them food, and trying to improve the human condition. And, and to focus on parking, uh, to me, is, is totally inappropriate because getting a mobile unit out into the community will not, uh, will, will, the parking issue has been there forever. They've been around for 45 years, for God's sake. 45 years in that community providing services. They were, they were applauded for all the services that they provided, providing uh, COVID testing, vaccines for thousands of individuals in that community. And for them to not to be able to continue to focus on the people who need it the most, and that was the lesson learned from the COVID. If you don't deal with the folks that need it the most, it impacts the entire community. So please, let them be flexible. Give us a, a letter. That's all we need is a letter stating that, you know, a special use permit is not necessary so that they can move around and provide services and get improve the situation. We have an, un an unhoused dilemma in San Jose. This is going to help. So I don't understand. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. And I'm, I apologize for my <sighs> the way that I feel, but I don't understand the reality of this because this is such a simple Simple action. Let them go to the community and provide services and help you. Help Thank San Jose. You. Thank you. Next speaker. Oh, only two minutes talk. I think it's not enough for me, but I will speak fast. First of all, I don't understand why choosing the election days for the hearing about the land using, which is really not fair, and because you cannot collect the full information from the residents. I come from West San Jose. I represent the Mile Host School, elementary schools, communities, and also as well as West San Jose. The reason why I stand here is because uh, Mile Host School just be vote because last year, I mean, I mean, a few months ago, um, I mean, during the pandemic. But we surprisingly found Mile Host Schools was changing the zone. Today, I want to speak the, the rezoning things. I don't understand when West San Jose's only Mile Host School was changing the zoning. I mean, what a coincidence with the school closure. You know, I don't understand, are you going to give up the land of the school or you want to build a more high density density, I mean, housing, big, huge, giant amount, I mean, monster building between, I mean, I mean, I mean, closing in the uh, uh, housing residence area. And uh, why, why do the, I mean, rezoning for this school? And also for the West San Jose, the traffic, which um, I'm sorry, I have to say that, we totally against it to change the zoning to PQP because we are questioning: Are you going to build the housing on the, I mean, a high density housing 
on top of a school land. Be yeah, this is not right because a lot, I mean, kids, they, they need to go to school, okay? And the, the, you, you know, and, and also, Wei San was saying need you. a traffic study too because of so many Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I want to take a moment to commend you all for your efforts to shift to a culture of inclusion and equity and look forward to this becoming a priority for all San Jose residents. By finding that a special use permit is not necessary to operate our mobile clinic from the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley, in this way, it was, in the way that it was intended, you are joining them in their efforts to help ensure the survival and healing of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and the community by providing high quality comprehensive health care and wellness services. Efforts in opposition of this are examples of an ongoing harassment by neighbors who continue to attack the agency from a lens of privilege. If you look at Google Earth images of the area, including historical images, you'll see that this area is one of the least impacted by parking in comparison to any neighborhood in San Jose. Please make a truly informed decision that is equitable and inclusive and help IHCSCV continue its work to provide comprehensive health care to all of our community. I yield my time. Moving to Zoom, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I um, I just wanted to offer a reminder that in 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 your work uh, towards more efficient uh, practices in the future of urban urban village design and planning, um, we have to be really cautious. I think and sensitive, and I don't think um, what's the term um, you know to make the process easier in the future and more efficient. I can't remember the term that's used for it, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can do that so much with urban village things. I know you want to efficient, make it more efficient in some ways, but we just can't really, uh, we have to be sensitive. We have to be cautious. <laughs> That's, those are my two important words that I, I, I think we'll be saying a lot in the, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, yeah, we have to be wary. And so good luck in, in, in these sort of zoning questions and issues. And I also wanted to offer a certain amount of caution and, and sensitivity that's needed with uh, the future of uh, fossil fuel contracts in San Jose. And we've been doing some good work in California the past few years. Good luck in those continual efforts. And a thank you to uh, the new person, Giovanni, who's been speaking. He was about to make an important point about a, a fossil fuel contract item that was on the consent calendar agenda that Tony Tabor um, very sadly didn't allow him to speak about. I don't know why that happened, and I'm sorry that it did. Good luck how he can have a more open space to talk at public comment time in his uh, beginning new attempts. I think we should offer him uh, a good space. Thank you. Marsha. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, city council members. Um, I'm representing my neighbors in the uh, 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 West Side Marhouse uh, neighborhood. Uh, we would like to keep the Marhouse as an education purpose because the school uh, got closed uh, that we need to uh, fight for the school reopening. And we, uh, we need to prepare for the kids for the good education environment. And uh, the case is the future of our society and we, we cannot deteriorate their learning environment. So uh, we need this opportunity to keep the uh, school re as an education purpose, keep the own, uh, zoning at the same. Thank you. Egypt. Hello, my name is Egyptiana Lundy, and I would like to talk to you about the infant formula shortage item 3.4. Um, my name is, like I said, Egyptiana Lundy, and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. I wanted to voice my complete support for these oh, efforts I, to declare this. I think you're speaking on the wrong item. Uh, that's item 3.4? Yes, 3.4. Okay. 
Okay, we'll get back. We'll come back to you. Um, Ami. Hello. Um, thanks for all to give me the time to um speak here. I'm the Maya House neighborhood. I was um very surprised that um you decide to change the zone um coding immediately after CUSD decide to close Maya House. Um, I noticed that Maya House is the only school that will code to um PQP. Um. <laughs> Total, uh, tell the truth, I totally have no idea what, what does that mean. But we, we, we will learn from the um, buckling, buckling uh, rezoning. We, we, we will suddenly notice that it, the buckling will be, will allow to um, stand there for seven, seven, seven floor high buildings there. Our privates were totally missed. So, so I, I'm not sure what the future of mayor house. What, how can the community to keep keep their environment to 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 be a peaceful area to to stay? I I I personally didn't observe the cities, and I, I think it, it is kind of um good way to get most uh, house nearby but that that doesn't mean we should um close our school for the housing it's unfair and i think this is in the california there's plenty of lenders you can um develop everywhere why you want to stay on the um so stupid communities to 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 uh, to give more space to to be more cloud please jill border hi thank you jill borders here i just want to comment a, a general comment when i'm looking at these land use items i've mentioned this before but the phrase comes to my mind every single time i can hear my dad's voice in my head saying confusion is of the devil <laughs> he would say and i am always confused Whenever I read all of what, you know, these land changes are gonna be the zoning and making it to go to the general plan zoning and all of this, you know, this is all very confusing. And I really wish if I could, you know, have a solution for this, I really wish the planning department, I know they don't have time, but if they did have time, it'd be really nice if we had some educational meetings They could be Zoom, they could just be like Q and A sessions where we ask, you know, how does, for example, um, because the first six of these items, I'm looking at them and they say things like it's going to go from the CN commercial neighborhood zoning to the UV urban village zoning. And then another one, light industrial zoning going to the UV uh, urban village zoning. And then another one going from this, this to UV urban village zoning. And when in the last 10 years, everything I know about the, the general plan and the difference between we we been told ad nauseum to begin with no 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 that's not land use designation that's zoning that's not zoning that's land use now that we're aligning them it appears to me that we're just sort of throwing a bundle of these into what we call urban village zoning district that i really have never been familiar with so i just wanted you to know that i try to stay up on these things but i'm very confused i would love an educational session and i'd also like to mention that one of them does say light industrial zoning district to the uv urban village zoning district and i was told quite distinctively because it had to do with the property across from our mobile home park that i said you know why are we being changed why not the light industrial so we have this lovely urban village plan and they said we would never touch light industrial and here we have so confusion giovanni Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay. I just wanted to uh, thank the guy that uh, uh, stood up for me earlier. Yeah. My name is Giovanni, by the way. And uh, thank you for letting me speak this time. Uh, like I was trying to speak last time about something that I felt like was important to me as a, a Latino coming from the middle class in San Jose. I, I felt like what I was going to speak on was important, but um, I, I'm getting used to the, these public speakings. I, I'm, I just started getting involved this week. I will be getting involved more and I will get used to the rules. I just wanted to 
say thank you for giving me the time to speak again. And that's all I have for now. CC? Uh, hello. Hi, uh, this is CC from my host community as well. So I have a few questions and a few comments. Um, the first question, as a few uh, other speakers mentioned as well, why Maya Hall School is the only school that the zoning is proposed to change to PQP uh, and right after the school closure and the school site has been dis um, declared a, surchar a surplus. And that's the first question. And second question, why 112 at Maya Hall's neighborhood zoning near Waverlyn are rezoned, proposed to be rezoned from multi-family zoning district to, uh, to urban residential zoning, uh, which as per the code, I'm not familiar, I just checked, uh, can be built um, with medium density uh, residential building or standalone commercial, uh, like a retail and offices. So this is not really consistent with what the current land is uh, being used for, right? And the Barkland project has been proved to build high density building already. And with two out of three West San Jose uh, elementary schools have been closed, I feel like it's completely contradictory, right? Have you really evaluated the environmental impact, traffic impact, and safety impact? At one hand, the school district closing two West San Jose neighborhood schools stating the enrollment decline, right? And then pack off uh, K to five students in West, entire West San Jose to one school in to Delworth, making Delworth the largest elementary school in the entire neighboring school district. And on the other hand, we're changing zoning to, you know, to make a multi-family zoning to, you know, urban UB and, you know, to accommodate high density, um, you know, buildings. This is kind of like a ridiculous. Back to council. Okay, uh, Chris, <laughs> help us understand. Um, I think we all want a mobile clinic. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. Um, so obviously we covered a, a lot of ground there. Um, I just wanna, can I just reference the rezoning first, just to talk about um, the school and the PQP. Obviously this is the next in a series of AB 1333 rezonings that align our zoning with our general plan. Um, so the school property has an existing PQP general plan designation, which is appropriate. It's PQP stands for public quasi public. It's a land use designation that's used for schools, community centers, other quasi, you know, public quasi public types of land uses. Um, so we're actually sort of bringing that into consistency. Obviously the planning department is currently working on policy work around the future use of school lands where they're surplus under our uh, what we call our YOSL um, work, which is uh, yes on school lands, as we look at the potential for future uses for surplus school lands. Um, but that, that will come later on. Right now, this action is just keeping us in line with state law. Um, as, as far as the special use permit, uh, there's a number of different things sort of going on there. So we have an existing medical office building, um, and they have a mobile clinic um, that, that sort of there's an interest in using in a mobile way, right? And we certainly support that, um, but it will be stored on the site. And so what they're doing is taking up two parking spaces uh, and we would classify the use as a mobile vending facility. Um, and so normally that wouldn't require a special use permit, but because this is essentially an RV, it's a bigger vehicle. It's bigger than our standards require or allow, and therefore it's subject to a special use permit. So we actually think this is an appropriate use for the site. The site is actually slightly overparked, so um, while we're working with the neighborhood and, and being very mindful around how the parking impacts the surrounding neighborhood, technically by the standards of the zoning ordinance, it meets those requirements. Um, and that's the action that you have before you, is the use of that as a mobile vending facility on the site. With regards to use of that vehicle off the site, um, that's not something that we currently regulate through the zoning code in that way. We, there's probably a little bit more work that we would want to do to coordinate that um, and understand what the applicant is looking for um, for their uh, authorization through other bodies. But as a vehicle that's sort of moving around other sites, that's not something we would necessarily regulate in this way. So really what we're talking about is the use of that vehicle on the site. That's the special use. Right, okay. And obviously we're in the land use business, so we don't regulate vehicles that move around. So I guess, um, 
I'm looking at our fearless leader of Gardner Healthcare and hoping that he might explain what he, what he believes he needs from us in order to move forward. Raimundo, do you wanna, I'm sorry, I can't tell, is that, that is Raimundo, isn't it? Yeah, Raimundo, could you, could you come forward? I think, I think we, we'd like to understand better. Um, I was worried the mask was hiding the identity of somebody else, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's clear you believe there's a very strong impediment here and we'd like to understand what it is and what we can do to get out of the way. I, for us, what our understanding is, is it Sonia, is that um, if we can just get a letter that a super, uh, that a uh, special use permit is not necessary, then she can take that to the state and get, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, then we can get our uh, license to be able to operate the facility or the mobile vehicle throughout the uh, throughout the city. Throughout the city. Okay. And we haven't regulated this before, and so Chris, is there a reason why we wouldn't be able to give you give a letter that says you don't need a special? Yeah, I think we just need to do a, a little bit more coordination and work with this, but certainly it's something we want to facilitate. So. So we're happy to sort of work through the issues on the sort of mobile use and find a way that we can get the state authorization so they can continue, they can operate in that way. And then the special use permit would cover the use of the vehicle on the site um, in the interim or as applicable. Okay. Um, you guys are nodding your head, so I'm hoping we're that good. we're yes, on, we're on that, our way. That okay. Would that would work. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Foley? Yeah, I just wanted to be clear. I just raised the question of parking. It wasn't because I objected to the expansion and the mobile clinic that uh, aspirations that you have. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but so I, I just wanted to be clear. I actually am very supportive of the proposal in front of us. And I had several questions related to the use permit and, and all of that. So you're able to, what we're doing today, you're able to offer stationary on your site but that's not really what you want to do. You want to be mobile with your with your uh, clinic, which absolutely makes perfect sense because then you can go to your clients instead of them coming to you. Exactly. And and I, I think that's great. So I think we have a motion on the table and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Councilman Ramona. Oh, I thought I saw other buttons push, but Raimundo, since you're up here, I have a question. I know Gardner already has some yeah. mobile sort of yeah. vehicles, RVs, whatever you want to call them. Do you already, I mean, how does that work? Do you require a letter for the state there? How did yeah, that come about? We already got it a long time ago. Okay, right, so that's just been done a long, long time ago. We've had it uh, before 1986, so. Okay, all right. <laughs> so this is one of the more newer, okay. Yeah, we have a healthcare to the homeless program. Right, right, right. That's why I was just wondering if, okay. All right, okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Councilmember Mayhem. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, my question was actually for Chris on the school sites, not on the mobile unit. Thank you. Um, so, Chris, I just, I wanted to go back to that. I know you gave us a little bit of a summary there, but I'm, I'm certainly hearing concerns, not, not just in District 1, certainly in my own district. I know last year we approved a project in District 9. I, I think as school sites, as we're seeing declining student enrollment, sites are being shut down. I, I think there is a lot of concern in the community about what our plan is or what we would like to see happen on these sites. I certainly hear from many residents a desire, if possible, to see public benefit continue to come from these sites and, and not just housing, but, um, you know, I guess my question for you is, what what is our plan for having a plan? When when are we going to be able to communicate with the public as to what, what our vision is for these sites and what the best uses are? Because I understand, and maybe you want to repeat for folks that we're 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 following state law here and trying to get in compliance, so we can separate that piece out. It sounds like we need to take that action, but more broadly, uh, you mentioned our plan for school lands, and I just was hoping you could say a little more on that. Yeah, thank you, council member. So, uh, so as you said, we are bringing this into uh, conformance with state law. So the underlying land use decision on what the land should be was a decision that was made as part of the general plan. Probably, you know, when we adopted it in 2011, it may have predated that even. Um, and, and yes, you're right. So we have a, a longer term plan to look at how we sort of uh, consider PQP lands in a number of different ways. And, and I wanted to sort of 
broaden the question just slightly because I think it's important to sort of, you know, focus on the perspective that we need a, a balanced mix of land uses throughout the city. And our PQP lands aren't just school sites. They're churches, you know, they're so the community centers. There's a whole host of other uses that are appropriate. And I think uh, to your point, you know, as we look forward to the future, um, you know, we know that the school enrollments can be cyclical. We know that the demographics are working against us throughout San Jose in a number of different ways. Um, so we have to have, you know, a lot of consideration for how we see those lands. Um, it, it's certainly not something where we're looking to convert them just straight to residential. I think we need to ensure that we preserve the opportunity for future public serving uses um, that are appropriate on sites like that. And that's why we're taking a, a very considered approach. The first step is to really look at church lands and how we do uh, affordable housing on sort of excess church lands, especially the sort of parking lots. And that's so uh, we refer to that as our Yigby work. Um, and that, that's work that's currently underway. Um, the work specifically on school lands and what the future of that project looks like is sitting behind that in, in the work plan, uh, in the queue of things that we need to get to. So it, it's currently not under process, but we hope to be uh, to bring that work forward um, probably uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, so as we look to 2023, I would imagine that's, that's probably the time frame. That but by next fiscal about. year, you mean not the one we're about to begin, the one after no, that? No, so probably towards the end of the one we're about to begin. So Okay, uh, so, so about, about this a little, a little less than a year from now, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's a rough guesstimate based on sort of other work that's in front of it um, and certainly right. some of the bigger picture pieces we're working through. Yeah, and I understand you have a ton on your plates. I, just, I, I do think it's important. I mean, we know we have a need for child care and child-related services for elder care. There are a number of public needs we have, and um, I'm certainly hearing very consistently from the community that they're worried about our school sites simply being rezoned, developed as housing, and then that's kind of it. And so I just, I think we need to make sure we're doing what we can to preserve opportunities for public uses, public benefits on those sites where appropriate. So I look forward to that conversation. I'd encourage us to certainly incorporate community input into that process as you begin it later in the year. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's Thanks. exactly our, our concern. So I uh, appreciate yeah. you making the point. Okay, great, thank you. Councilman Ricard. Thanks, I'll try to be quick. I'll preface this by saying I'm a little uncomfortable that we're having a conversation, an item that wasn't pulled from the consent, but I'm going to do it anyway, since everyone else has. <laughs> um, so I just want to, first of all, just make comments about the, the item on PQP. This, this zoning is zoning it for school use. It's making sure that the zone says PQP is this, this site is a PQP site and a school can be there. It's not changing it. I want the public to understand that. Um, but I just want to say one other thing about these kind of lands. These we don't own this land. We don't control this land. These are school district properties, and school districts are autonomous bodies. And I'm always very cautious about us as a school city telling school districts what they can and can't do with their land. Obviously, we control overall zoning, so we will be making decisions about how and what the appropriate zoning use. But we also should be um, partners with our local school districts who are trying to serve a valuable function to our community. And I get very concerned when we sit here and say that we should have, you know, be dictating the use of a school. But this particular action today makes no decision about a school property except that a school can be there and that the zoning previously was not aligned with that. So it's important for the public to understand. Thank you. All right. Uh, going online, any of my colleagues like to speak? I don't see any hands. So um, we do have a motion on all three items. Is that right? Consent? Yeah. Okay. Let's vote on all three then. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, given the challenges we've got with the schedule today, uh, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're going to um, take a few items that uh, were agendized and noticed to the public. We're going to prioritize those. So we're going to first go to 9.1, which is Successor Agency Board, the San Jose Redevelopment Agency, uh, ROPS schedule for 22-23. And I don't think there's any presentation here. Am I opening a hearing? Is that what I'm doing? No, I'm not. Nope, this is just, just approved. That's it. 
All right. Uh, is there a motion? Councilman Cohen, your Oh, name? sorry. I was oh. just going to move approval. Okay. Good time to do it. There's a motion. Councilman Cohen, second. Councilman Perales. Uh, we have yeah, one, one member of the public. Blair Beekman. Blair Beekman. Hi. Um, Blair Beekman here. Um, I don't, this is uh, some sort of budgeting for 2022 and 23, and you're just starting to better talk about that. And I just wanted to note that at this time, and good luck how uh, these sort of items can be open and accountable, how we can really view and peer into uh, responsible practices into 2023. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, thank you. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Frosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Sorry, this is Esparza. Yes. Thank you. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, item 3.6. I know some folks have been waiting for this for a while on the back there. Uh, renewal of the San Jose uh, Downtown Property Based Business Improvement District, affectionately known as the PBID. Now I got a script here. Uh, so everybody hang tight. Here we go. Uh, item 3.6 is the public hearing and assessment ballot proceeding on the renewal expansion and levy of the annual assessments to property owners within the Downtown San Jose Property Based Business Improvement District. The council will open the public hearing on this item in order to hear and consider all testimony by inter interested persons relating to the renewal and expansion of the district. At that time, the city clerk will begin to collect ballots and commence tabulating the ballots. The council will also consider authorizing the city clerk to vote in favor of district renewal and expansion as the owner of property within the district. Prior to the close of the public hearing, council will direct all property owners who have not already submitted their ballot to submit their ballots to the city clerk for tabulation. No ballots will be accepted after the conclusion of the public hearing. Uh, now, uh, in this case, Tony, I know that you're going to be tabulating for the next week. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we'll tabulate today and report out next week. I got it. Okay, so you got to get the ballot in now. Yeah, I have no hands for the public. Wait, are, have you opened the public hearing? Let's open the public hearing. All right, public, who would like to speak? I have no hands up on this item. All right. Uh, a, a hand just went up for Jill Borders. Welcome, Ms. Borders. Hi, just a quick question for clarity. I was reading the letter that it's attached to this item and at the beginning it says, I request the city manager or city clerk to please read this letter during public presentation. Is that something that is ever done up to two minutes where you read the letters out loud that, that are sent in? I'm just curious, it's point of clarification. All right. Um, so I assume it's premature Norm, I'm sorry to hit you with this question as you're checking, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's, is it premature for me to ask the council to consider approving a motion authorizing the clerk to vote in favor of district renewal uh, relating to the city's property or should we be waiting until next week to do that? No, I need I need that ballot cast today. Yes. You need that need cast to today. Yes. I'll, I'll move right. approval of that, Mayor. Second. Second. Okay, there was a, a motion from Council Member Peralis and a second from Council Member Foley the public hearing is now closed. Uh, and uh, we have a motion and a second. Are there any property owners who wish to submit a ballot to the clerk? If so, then you must submit your ballots now. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody racing to the front with their ballots. Uh, so now we're really closing the public hearing. Uh, the city clerk will not accept any further ballots from this point forward. There's, the clerk does need some time to tabulate the ballots. That will be done over the next week. I understand it. Um, okay, so uh, we do need a motion. I mean, we have a motion. We need a vote on the motion. 
with regard to the city's vote. Is that yes. correct? Yes. So let's vote on that now. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Davis? Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lepardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so the city voted, and uh, now we're gonna tie with the rest of the ballots and just to really heighten the suspense, we're gonna come back next week with all that. Is that right? Yes. So Scott, hold on. All right, we're gonna move on then to the next item. Can Unless I register an I vote on that vote? Yes. Thank you. All right, that's a belated I, Councilmember Davis. And um, I don't believe that there's anything more I need to do on that item, correct? Okay. Let's now move ahead, item 6.2. This is also set for public hearing. Sewer service and use charge and storm sewer service charge rates. Uh, there is no presentation. This is a time for the public to speak on this item. I also have a script on 6.2. Oh, you have that or do I, I have, have it? it? You don't have a script. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so it looks like, a, okay, subsequent to ESD supplemental mem memorandum dated June 2nd, the city clerk's office has received 23 additional sanitary sewer protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 232 for the proposed sanitary sewer rates. Um, and then, then we go to public speaker. And I have some in-person public speakers for 6.2. I have Red and Jeff. Whoever gets to the microphone first, please come to the microphone. And the next person just line up behind me. Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Rod, and I live down in uh, Coyote Road and Blossom Hill Road. And uh, I'm here to, uh, uh, they're about to raise our, in that area. I don't know what parts of the city they're doing this to, or if it's just in that area. Uh, uh, they're gonna raise the garbage rates and the water, um, and um, I talked to some of my neighbors there, and they're also against this. Uh, some of us there in that area, uh, I'm, I'm one of them. That um, I'm uh, retired. I'm on uh, fixed income, and you know, right now I'm already paying. Uh, uh, they're over $600 uh, a year there for garbage. Um, and uh, I honestly don't think that that is fair for some of us to, uh, especially with everything else is going up, not just those things as we know. I mean, everything from gas to food to whatever. So I was just wondering that uh, what, what, um, how are you going to make a decision about this? Whether or not you're going to continue, you are going to raise the rates or not? I don't know if there's anybody else here about, uh, you know, to protest about this or uh, to talk against this. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's what I wanted to come and say that, uh, some of us just can't afford these rates any, any more than the way that they are, you know. I mean, I'm paying you know, almost $6,000 in taxes, property taxes now, and I mean, come on. <laughs> you Thank know, this you. is just getting crazy here in, in, in the city and in California. Thank That's you. why a lot of people are moving out of California, so we all. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Jeff Kershaw. I'm here representing myself as a 45-year San Jose resident and also the shopping centers of Plaza de San Jose, Plaza de San Jose Pad, and Gould Plaza on Capitol McLaughlin. 
when you look at those shopping centers, especially if you look at Plaza, you think, oh my gosh, Target can certainly afford to pay more for sewer charges. But what you forget about is that the lifeblood of those shopping centers is the small mom and pop tenants. Those tenants who have been hurt by COVID and of course are, well, we're not fiscally conservative here. <laughs> I mean, so we spend an awful lot of money and it's, we have a lot of people who are gonna go out of business. You know, you, you Target, McDonald's, whatever, one thing, but Susie's Nails or Sam's Foe, whatever you want to, whatever it is, this increase in one year is going to hurt them significantly. What I'd asked for, I wrote a letter and I hope you all read it. Um, I think it's something you could amortize. I, I guess we have to expand the facilities and make improvements and that's fine. But let's push it over some number of years out to the future so that we don't hurt these people who are already suffering due to the losses they suffered from COVID. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to Zoom speakers. I have Chad Smith. Good afternoon, and thank you for this moment. I'd also like to take a moment to offer a um, a good luck to everybody from city council who is on the ballot today. I dropped my ballot off earlier and uh, it's one of my favorite days of the year. Aside from that, I'd just like to say that the rate increases for those of us like myself, um, while not retired as the first in-person speaker was, um, but are on a fixed income because I'm a public school teacher, uh, it, it hurts, uh, it, it makes a difference Everything recently has made a difference and, and not in a good way. Um, and I'm not talking about the pandemic, but I'm talking about uh, increased costs at the grocery store and at the gas station. And that really eats in when you don't get a raise from your school district that is commensurate with increased costs just to live and support and raise a family. Um, so I would strongly urge city council to not vote for increases at this time. Thank you. Larry Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, hopefully I can be quick for this item. Uh, thank you that there's actually, there's a fair number of public speakers today on, on such an item. Uh, I think hopefully is always a friendly reminder and the importance of uh, good subsidy practices that are available to ourselves at this time and that you can talk about these sort of subsidy projects uh, programs with community. Uh, you know, it sounds like it can be really helpful for an item such as this. And that um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that it can, it can simply be okay to talk about the concepts of a uh, sea level rise as a community effort at this time. It doesn't have to be alarmist. It doesn't have to be frightening. It can just be very realistic and matter of fact in what we're dealing with, with sea level rise <laughs> issues. And uh, good luck how that can be an easier process for all of us to talk about in the coming months. Thank you. Indu. Hi, I would like to state on this issue, just uh, as I will on um, the next two items on agenda that talk about cost increases, is that for those of us who take our environmental footprint very seriously and try to use less of everything, um, the, the entire approach of just raising the rates on everyone is a real punch in the gut because there's nothing in the plan for our utilities, um, whether it is to do with water and sewer or it is to do with garbage, that encourages good behavior. There are several of us that work towards circularity of economy, really, really reducing our um, garbage output, our sewer output, our water use. And what is city council doing in order to create programs for the super users who are going to be the, the role models that everyone else can emulate in our fight against climate change. I know that San Jose and the, the city council takes climate change very seriously. And so when you vote over here, I would really urge you to think about what you can do to encourage the people that do not use more um, and, and, and create, a, create 
options in these programs that we are not overcharged like the rest of the people who don't care about this. Thank you. Back to the council. And actually, we're back to me because I have a script. <laughs> back um, to you, Tony. The total of all written protests together, or the total of all written protests during the public protest period, together with this public speaker's protesting the rate changes today, represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in sanitary sewer rates. Therefore, Council may consider staff's recommendation for sanitary sewer service and use charge rate increases. Thank you. Okay, um, Carrie, I, I know you're here. Um, <laughs> would, would you or anyone on your team just like to explain for those who are present? Um, I know there was no rate increases I recall last year, uh, uh, roughly on average 9% or so increase this year. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the nature and the basis for the increase? Thank you. Thank you, Carrie Romnell, Director of Environmental Services. Um, I'm joined by Nick Aljuni, Al our um, admin officer who uh, runs all the numbers for us. So, um, so as you may recall, last year there was no increase, which um, which does impact this year's increases. Um, the increase the increases are for needed improvements to the regional wastewater facility as well as our citywide collection system. Both uh, both do require investment. Um, the increase is works out to approximately th an additional three dollars per month um, for residential customers. Um, we um, we did sort of downsize as much as we could, um, but um, if we were to not do um, a nine percent increase this year and we were to zero that out again, that would result in fifteen to twenty percent increases next year. Right, and and I know there's a suggestion about amortizing. In fact, we we do finance these improvements, uh, correct? We, we don't simply pay as we go. We do, um, our finance department has done an excellent job um, sort of smoothing the rates uh, as a result uh, of the needed capital improvements, the operating and maintenance um, dollars we don't finance. We do, uh, we do pay as you go for those um, and those are impacted as well by some of the capital programs. But um, we have through our financing plan, um, sort of as you indicate, amortized it and spread it out over um, over a longer period of time than just each year. Okay, and when you came in as director, I think you inherited a system that was about, you know, a waste plant, for example, that was about 40 or 50 years old, 50, I guess, probably, when you came in. Um, uh, and uh, you're now undertaking a multi-billion dollar uh, capital upgrade. I assume that there is not much room for error <laughs> in terms of replacing aging sewer equipment in a city of this size. Um, you want to talk a little bit about why, why it's imperative we actually spend the dollars to invest to replace the facility? Well, thank you. So in, in 2013, Council adopted the Plant Master Plan, which set out um, a plan to ensure the continued safe operation of the wastewater treatment facility. And so that plan laid out our capital projects, how we would finance them, how we would spread them over uh, a 15-ish year, year, 15 year timeline. Um, and then what's important to remember is that the wastewater facility is operating um, while we're doing the, the rebuild. And so we um, have successfully not had releases into the bay, which we, we'd like to continue. Um, but it also helps the, the um, community continue to grow and expand um, through the safe operation of that facility. Um, there was a time period where council did not approve rate increases for about a decade. And, uh, and that did result in uh, significant deterioration of the facility that, um, that now we're doing, I think, a really good job of catching up on, but it does have, um, unfortunately, uh, increased costs associated with it. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So uh, the reality is we're catching, uh, we're playing a game of, of fiscal catch up uh, with a facility that's reaching the end of its, its useful life and it requires uh, many, uh, well, more than a billion dollars worth of investment to keep it keep it running. Yes, and we're putting systems in place so that we don't um, we don't ever fall into that same position again. Thank you, Carrie. Councilor Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Um, you just you just said that 
there was no increase last year. Do you have a little, can you give a little historical perspective as to how these rates have increased with time? Hi, uh, Nick Agiloni, the Administrative Officer for the Environmental Services Department. Um, over the last several years, uh, we had a 3%, or sorry, uh, we had a 3% increase in fiscal year 2018-2019, and a 3% increase in 2019-2020, uh, followed by a 4% increase in 2021. And then in 21-22, um, we decided to um, not move forward with the rate increase knowing that the, uh, it would be offset by having a higher increase this year. Um, and then as Kerry had mentioned, um, if we do not move forward with a rate increase this year, we would be looking at 15 to 20% um, the following fiscal year. So it sounds like you're also saying that there's an increase coming future years. We'll have to continue to increases to, fi to continue to finance the work that we're doing at the uh, treatment plant. Correct, there'd be um, more modest increases. More modest than this one. This is sort of the bigger one and then it's kind of almost making up for last year not having an increase. Is that the idea here? Partially, we uh, are expecting um, increased operational costs moving forward in the next two years so that would hit uh, rates. So we would be looking at, I believe uh, it's 9% this year, 9% or 10% next year, um, and then they drop off um, to 2-3% to uh, after that. And that would be exclusive of collection system needs. And we're, we also, we obviously, our plant treats water from other jurisdictions and not just San Jose residents. So this rate increase is a rate increase for all users plugging into the system, not just San Jose residents. Um, so this increase is to pay for our proportional share. Um, how other agencies um, set their rates, we're not really familiar with. So we're charging the jurisdictions and then they will decide yeah. how whether they have to increase the rates on their users. Yes, because like us, they also have collection systems. Some of them also um, bundle garbage service and, and other services. Okay. Um, do we have a comparison about how other, how, how our rates then here compare to other cities in the Bay Area, for example, that are outside of our plant, treatment plant zone? I actually don't think um, we have that. We don't. I don't oh, think we benchmark okay. against that. I would just to be curious to know: is are we uh, com competitive in that regard? Um, and, and my last question, maybe I don't know if it's for you, or more generally, and it's, it's I want to ask this about all three of the items we have coming up. It includes the garbage and the water. After that, what kind of resources do we have as a city, as an area, to help people who have trouble paying these increased rates, whether it's small businesses or uh, residential customers? Um, for the sewer service and use charge, um, because it is um, regulated by Prop 218, as most, most, of our, um, most of our funds are, we do not have a low income uh, program. It is charged on the property taxes. Uh, for residential, businesses are handled um, a little bit differently, but um, we presently don't have any low income support programs. Um, the general fund could decide to take that on. And that's something that um, that certainly we could explore, but it's not something that we're budgeted to explore. Um, the fee is right now about forty-five dollars per uh, per household per year, right? And so oh, per month, oh, per month, right? Um, so those are charged directly. I'm just so are there third are there state organ uh, programs then for low income residents to get us to get assistance, or is it, that doesn't exist at all? Um, it, it doesn't exist to our knowledge um, to uh, it. So it's very different from um, the drinking water uh, incentives or rebate or uh, support that we've seen over the last year or two related to the pandemic. Um, the sewer service and use charge um, is a flat fee. Um, and that's how we have chosen to administer it over the last several decades. And we do that, um, which differs from some cities will do it based on your water use. So how much you're discharging, which one of the callers referred to. Um, we don't do it that way because historically the administrative costs of that um, would uh, be very, fairly significant. Um, certainly something as rates continue to rise, we may want to, um, to look at that would shift the cost differently. So a household with a lot more people in it would pay a lot more than a household with, uh, with fewer people. Okay. And then the answer you gave also translates to your answer you would give if I asked the same question about garbage 
as well. I mean, so I'm asking about all of them, not just the stormwater. Um, garbage, we are exploring um, a low income program um, based on council direction. We'll, we'll look at that in the next year. But we don't have one currently, and there's not necessarily a resource out there. We, we don't have one yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember Foley. I'm sorry, Councilmember Cohen. I, I um, Nick did just give me the um, the rate comparison, um, and um, we are, for example, forty one dollars and sixty four cents currently, um, and Milpitas is fifty nine dollars and seventeen cents. So we're actually the lowest cost of Milpitas, Sunnyvale, Cupertino, West Valley, Mountain View, Santa Clara, and Palo Alto. And those are within those are the users of our system. We don't necessarily know how we compare to other systems. Yes. Right. So in other words, like San Francisco or Oakland. Right. But that's still good to know that they're charging their rate, their users way more to tap into our system than we do. Yeah. And we, OK, thank you. Uh, Council member Foley. Thank you. Just, just to confirm the. Uh, this increase will show up on the residential property tax bill. Is that correct? Yes. OK, so it'll show up uh, the consumers or property owners won't see this until they get their bill in September or November and which isn't due until December and split. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure. And then, but you said that's not how businesses are billed. Can you tell me how a small business is, pays for that? Uh, the land, the property owner pays the property tax bill. So it's not included in the property tax bill. So, so it depends on the size of the business. So small businesses are handled very different from um, large industrial users that we would call a monitored industry that discharges um, significantly. But I'll have um, I'll ask Nick to provide a little bit more context. Thank you. Yeah. So the um, small businesses that, that we have, um, I believe there's um, sixty thousand small businesses in San Jose. They are uh, billed on the uh, property tax roll. Uh, now that's compared to the large industries or the monitored industries. There's about 30 of them um, that are direct billed, um, I believe, quarterly. So uh, as a small business owner, I'm going to see a bill uh, on the personal on the property taxes that I pay related to the prop personal property that I own. I don't get a property tax bill. I get a uh, I have to file a tax assessment on the prop personal property that I own. So where am I going to see this on my bill? I'm, I'm just trying to clarify it's, it because there was a question about small businesses. Through the tax assessments. Okay. So what, small businesses are billed in the same manner as the residential. Okay. But what if the small business doesn't own the real estate? I'm, that's what's confusing right. me. So oh, my, sorry, yeah, sorry about that. So that would be the the property owner would um, determine how they pass those. Okay, possible. and then they're passing it on through a triple net lease or whatever type of lease they have. Got it. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't really understanding that. Thank you. That's the only question I had. Thank you, Councilmember Mayhem. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate my colleagues' questions. Councilmember Cohen exhausted most of mine. I, I did want to pick up on on one uh, point he was getting to, and I, I still was unclear on why this year would be 9%, last year 0% if we're explicitly trying to smooth cost increases. I mean, is there a reason we didn't aim to do four and a half each year? Or just because I think the sticker shock of 9% is, is, is a big deal for many people. So last year, um, we would have preferred to do, to do an increase. Um, obviously, the um, pandemic had some influence over that. Did yeah. try, and, try and smooth things because of the cumulative effect of all rate increases. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, garbage was pretty high last year. Yep. And so, uh, so looking to kind of minimize or at least moderate the, uh, the total impact of it. But we also have some significant um, large projects in play this year, including the dewatering project that, um, that is fairly expensive and will also have a, a increased O&M cost. And yep. so, um, so that sort of had it, has, has it had this two-year increase and yep. then um, and then go back to a place we would prefer. Yeah, I figured the pandemic was part of the, and the other rates were part of the story there. And then just on the end of this two-year bump, is it is it not um, 
is it, would it not make sense for us to extend that second year over the course of years three and four rather than go nine nine three or whatever you just said it might be I, I don't remember the exact numbers so, so we find we do finance the uh, capital projects but the O&M projects we don't finance and so um, so where there's where we need to absorb increased operations and maintenance um, costs those those do result in um, increase because they're not financed um, and so um, and so the rate forecasts that we're referring to now um, are exclusive of collection system needs. So as the collection system continues to do their master planning, our expectation is they will also have um, some increased needs and then we'll look to bundle those together to have a smooth increase. But uh, we don't have that, all of that information now. DOT is working their way through that. Okay, got it. And then finally, on this question of better aligning incentives and maybe charging or uh, more based on on use, um, what would just roughly what would the cost be to to evaluate and and understand what it would take to implement that change? Um, I don't know, but um, definitely something that um, that we'll look to assess in the next year. But um, as you can imagine, the, the administrative costs um, of reading mod, uh, water meters, et cetera. Um, San Jose Water has put forward a request to the state that they can release that information more readily to cities. That'll help reduce some of the, um, the burden to collect that information. But it would also result in um, rate changes. So your bill would uh, fluctuate based on your, your usage, which sure. um, not everyone, uh, I imagine, would be able to absorb as well. But it would more potentially more effectively um, share costs. Could incentivize efficiency, but yeah, I, I understand there are trade-offs there. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, let's then, there is a motion, isn't there? No, not, not yet. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. Second. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Crowder? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Item 6.3 is the public hearing on residential garbage and recycling rates for single family and multifamily residential. There's no presentation. So no, we'll but go. there's a script. Oh, there's a script. Here I have we go. a script for this one and the next one. Subsequent to ESD supplemental memorandum dated June 2nd, the city clerk's office received 49 additional residential garbage and recycling rate protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 303 for the proposed residential garbage and recycling rate. And now we go to speakers. Um, I have two speaker cards for Red and um, Hong Vo. Um, come, come to the microphone, whoever gets to the microphone first. Just state your name and start speaking. Red and Hong Bo, did they both leave? Welcome. Hello. My name is Heng Vu. I'm representing for my neighbor on White Tail Lane Road. It's about 30 house, and uh, we we received letter from the city uh, on letting us know the rates will be increased. And as you know, every day uh, we already pay a lot of uh, high cost living, especially gasoline. And now everything went up, and I. Um, my neighbor uh, just sent me here, you know, to let you know we pay a uh, very high property tax in the city of San Jose, and pg e went up, and now is you know the sewage, the garbage bill, and the water bill, and a lot of us uh, live in the neighborhood. We on the fixed income. And we do need help, you know. We we strongly against the race increase. And to let you know, we um, we also work with district 
A. Uh, regarding to our neighborhood um, street parking, uh, on that white tail lane road is a lot of um, illegal activity, but that's beside the subject today that I'm coming up with sewage, you know, water bill and garbage bill. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for letting much. me speak. Um, Ruth Callahan. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I didn't have my hand up. I was working. I, I beg your pardon. I don't have any comment. Thank you, Indu. Again, um, I would urge the council to very seriously consider the impact of added waste streams on um, climate change and reward those of us who take our climate impact very seriously. I, I do see um, that as a system, you, you have to raise the rates to, to understand um, how you can continue to offer the service to all residents, but reward the people who use the service less. Don't make everyone pay the same amount of money. Allow the system to be redesigned and implemented so that people can pay for what they use. Everything in this country works on the principle of how much you use. If you're more efficient with how much gas you put in your car, you pay less for gas. If you don't use the garbage service, if you don't throw as much waste as the next person does, you should have the option to pay less for garbage. Thank you. Dad Smith. Hi, and thanks for letting me speak again. Um, if I was opposed to the water sewage increase, you might expect that I would also be opposed to the garbage and recycling increase. Um, I've already stated some of the reasons, fixed income, uh, being a public school teacher and uh, with a wife who is a small business owner, et cetera, et cetera. But also the service. Um, I have been in contact with the service providers multiple times over the years as I have been a, a property owner. And they don't really do what they're supposed to do. Uh, they make it incredibly difficult to actually contact someone and they consistently do things that they're not supposed to, like knocking over all of the garbage cans on a street and setting them down in front of people's driveways. So the, the service provider is also problematic, at least in my neighborhood. Um, and even more than that, it, it just comes down to the cost. And, and not everybody has the time to come and speak at a forum like this. Um, or even the wherewithal to engage uh, with civic opportunities by submitting written requests, um, which <laughs> isn't the easiest uh, through our city. So again, um, even though there might be a small percentage of, based off of the population of San Jose that are speaking today, uh, it isn't a small percentage that is against the rate increases. So I would strongly urge you to vote against. Thank you. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the words of uh, a few callers ago. Uh, some very interesting points. Uh, I come, uh, my approach is uh, what I mentioned earlier and for the next item as well. Uh, it's important we learn how, you know, with, with important new subsidy plans that are available to ourselves at this time, that city government knows how to talk to the community about the subsidy options available to themselves. And I think nicely fits into what uh, a few speakers back had mentioned. Um, so good luck how, how to work on these issues and uh, the importance of being open at this time and clear what, what choices we have for ourselves. That, that's three quarters of the battle right there. And, and that, that's what builds a, a more harmonious, better community experience for all of us. Good luck in those efforts. And uh, a quick reminder, I, I should have used the term, uh, we don't have to use shock in order to uh, work on the issues of uh, climate change and sea level rise that's happening. We can just be very matter of fact about it and realistic and good luck in the, in how to be open in those efforts in the coming months. Thank you. Back to the council. 
All right. And that goes back to me again. The total of all written protests during the public protest period, together with the speakers protesting the rate changes today, represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in residential garbage and recycling rates. Therefore, council may consider staff's recommendation for residential garbage and recycling rate increases. Okay, uh, council member Jimenez. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment, and, and this is, I guess, for Tony. Uh, what, what I'm hoping to do is, because I, I suspect that some folks come to us uh, during some of these hearings, especially maybe for the first time, and they're not quite clear how, how things work. And so uh, if maybe at the outset of some of these, maybe we can just say that the council doesn't respond to some of the statements. We're just here to yeah, listen. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, because I, 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 it just becomes a little awkward sometimes, and I don't want people to think that we're just not being responsive or yeah. care about what they're saying. Reminder to the speaker. Yeah, thank you, Reminder, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, and we had a lot of conversations last year when we brought the garbage rate increase and talked about reduction in, in waste and how actually during the pandemic there was an increase in residential garbage across the city. And uh, I asked a lot of questions then about whether how we know whether who that was attributable to and whether there was a shift from businesses paying versus residents paying and all those questions. I don't want to rehash that this year. Um, but I, just a couple of questions and comments about, about levels of garbage um, and how we can charge. I mean, somebody raised a question about can we charge by use, and in some sense we do because we have different size cans, and when you get a larger can, you pay more. But within the specific can, you um, pay one rate. And I, my understanding is we don't have a mechanism, or I don't think we're legally allowed to charge like specifically by garbage, or I don't know what the answer to that. Can you just address that well, thank you so um in addition to um kind of the quantity of material at the curb there's also the fixed costs of um, trucks and drivers and sorting facilities and um, customer service reps etc and um, so it's not just sort of about the volume of material and um, we are in the process of uh completing a rate study that um, that will show us what other options we might have um, in terms of how we um, how we spread costs to pay for the service, and um, unfortunately, the pandemic did did slow our progress on that. Uh, but we are uh, in the midst of, of relooking at that model. And we we again we talked about this last year. I'm excited to see interested to see the results of of the study and our plans moving forward because we talked about in order to reduce uh, contamination of recycling, potentially giving everybody the larger can without charging different rates. That's still on the table, I assume, but we just don't know exactly how it's going to. Yes. Yeah. And then um, this November is our second um, uh, curbside study. So um, so every two years we do a curbside study to uh, to see what's in the recycling part and the levels of contamination. And so as we move away from uh, from the pandemic conditions, our hope is that that contamination will reduce and then that would have an associated rate reduction. Rate reduction it would have a, a, a reduction in cost uh, that we pay the haulers, which may or may not result in a rate reduction. And on the flip side, do we ever find out how many people are putting recyclings into the garbage that otherwise could have been recycled? I mean, do we do that kind of study? Um, we don't, but we do capture uh, anything that was not sorted correctly as we back end sort both the garbage right. and um, and the recycling. But the contamination, particularly now that we do organics and things in the garbage, the contamination of things that might have otherwise been recycled could prevent us from being as, as yes. good environmentally as we'd like to be. We have opportunities for improvement. Definitely. And then the only thing I'll say, I mean, obviously these rates include a lot of other things. They include yard waste, they include a large item pickup. And I, I just, I've been amazed to find out how few people understand, know about long, large item pickup. I know we tried to promote it. Um, I, want to, I want us to think about ways to promote it more. When I'm at the dumpster day and we have people showing up with their couch in the back, I say, wouldn't it have been much easier for you to just put this in front of your house and schedule a large item pickup? And they just, they say, what do you mean? And I don't even, I, I don't know how to do that. And so, People just don't know it's happening and it's shocking to me because I would never want to take the time to actually bring it somewhere if I didn't have to. So, and, and, and um, a, lot of, a lot more people uh, know about the program. I'm going to ask um, Deputy Director Valerie Osmond to talk a little bit about the increased usage, which also, um, as you note, does have um, an impact on our costs. But right. um, there's a lot of folks that are using the system, which we're thankful for, but certainly uh, looking to gain more, uh, more users. Thank you, Carrie. Valerie Osmond, Deputy Director, Environmental Services. So when we made the junk pickup program free and unlimited several years ago, we saw a significant increase each year of about 40 to 
um, increase in use, which has been great. Um, interestingly, in the last year, we've seen that level off a little bit, but we have seen an increase of first-time users. So I think the word is continuing to get out there and uh, more and more residents are coming to the program. Okay, great. And I'm committed as a council member, and I hope the rest of my colleagues are to continuing to remind our residents of that service. Thank you for answering my questions. All right. Any other comments? I'm going to go online here to check colleagues online. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Uh, just one quick question I had. Um, in each of the last couple of years, the rates have been twice as high for uh, single family as they have been for, for multifamily. And, um, you know, I understand certainly it, the, the capacity to pay, undoubtedly, it, it, to the extent that trickles down to renters, uh, is, is certainly greater for a single family homeowner typically. But just trying to understand the disparity better, uh, why the rate of increase would be so much different. At, thank you. So um, the residential or the single family rates include a contamination factor. So um, so the single family rates are influenced by um, the level of contamination in the recycling part. The multifamily contracts don't have that same influencer. Um, but what also happens in multifamily is if they have additional material, they'll um, increase their level of service. So they'll get more pickups, which they would be charged more for. So, um, so the four percent is for sort of a particular size bin, um, but if the if the pickup needs to be increased, you would see it um, in the frequency of it. So um, the models are somewhat different um, in that regard. Carrie, recall you saying that we had a significant spike of contamination during the pandemic. I'm guessing from looking at these numbers that 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 increase is continuing. Is that right? Um, we will know for sure in um, in the fall, but um, our hope is that two years ago was the peak of yeah. contamination in single family. We know that there is contamination in multifamily. The contracts just don't reflect that. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a motion. No, we don't. We need a motion. Motion to approve. approve. I'll second that. All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Bully? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Tony, I'm sorry. I I I didn't respond when you asked for my name. Uh, it's a yes. Thank you. All right, item 6.4, public hearings on the San Jose Muni water system potable and recycled water rates and charges for the next fiscal year. Tony, you've got a script. Yep, subsequent to ESD supplemental memorandum dated June 2nd, the city clerk's office has received six additional potable weight rate water rate protests. Therefore, the total number of valid written protests is 81 for the proposed potable water rate. No protests have been received in response to the proposed recycled water rate. And we'll go to public speakers. Um, Hong Bo, do you want to speak again? Are you, are you? Um, no, not not you yet. You're later. Um, Hong Bo, you you submitted for six point four as well. Oh, but you don't want to speak again. Okay. Um, I have no hands up and no speakers in person for this particular item. So, oh, so that goes back to me. Sorry. <laughs> the total of all written protests received during the public protest period represents less than 1% of all customers impacted by the change in water retail rates. Therefore, council may consider staff's recommendation for municipal water system rate increases. Okay. All right. Uh, are there motions or comments from my colleagues? So moved. Uh, second. There's a motion from the Vice Mayor, second from Councilman Cohen. Uh, Councilmember Sparta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask a question on 
the programs to assist folks with paying their water bills. Um, so it talked, uh, the memo talked about the arrearages program, but then talked about the local water assistance program that only just um, started to uh, accept applications for up to $2,000 to pay uh, water bills. Can you talk a little bit more about the program, how we're getting the word out? I believe all of us have, have shared that information in our newsletters and social media and all that, but um, how, how are people responding? Uh, what else are we doing as a city to get the word out on how to help pay water bills? Uh, thank you. Um, Jeff Provenzano is on Zoom. Um, so if we could promote him, um, he can help uh, talk the specifics. Um, we have sent um, communication out. Um, Jeff will know what the uptake has been or participation rate has been so far. Jeff, if you could raise your hand. Here. And thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, Jeff Provenzano, Deputy Director, Environmental Services Department. That's a good question. Um, the uh, Sacred Heart, who is the local service provider, uh, is just now finishing their webpage to begin uh, enrollment and application in the program. We actually have a city staff, San Jose Water Company and Great Oaks Water Company collaboration meeting this Friday with Sacred Heart to talk to them about their upcoming webpage and how we uh, and the messaging um, that we can do to help get customers um, uh, to enroll in that program. So it is it is moving and it's but it's just now starting. So um, so is information about that program, including the new website, going to go out with bills? Um, we're what, looking. What at exactly are we doing to get get the word out? Uh, multiple. So San Jose Water Company and Great Oaks will uh, do website um, information in their bills. Uh, we're also looking at developing citywide content to, uh, as city staff to develop citywide content that we can share with council offices and work with other city departments to to really target our our outreach um, on the Muni water side and some of the other utilities that we have with there's customers that we know have struggled in the past to make bills. We'll do targeted outreach to them to let them know of the program and get them connected with Sacred Heart. This is in addition to some of the other programs that Sacred Heart is, is doing. Okay, so we're going to folks that are in arrears now, right? Essentially, that's what you're saying is we're going to them saying, here's where you can go and get help in addition to all the other outreach that we're doing. Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, and then um, a follow up question on the Sacred Heart website. So you mentioned they created the website for this program last year when we talked about some of the um, the assistance programs that are out there for folks. Uh, one of the reasons we went to Sacred Heart is sort of a one stop shop help like rental assistance other utility assistance, because you know inflation is high people are getting hammered on in every way. Um, is Sacred Heart then going to take what information they get in from this website and, and see if folks need help in other programs as well? Yes, that is their intention. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it for me, Mayor. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions? There's a motion. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Is there a motion? Who made the motion? I think I'm Vice I, I did, Vice Mayor. Oh, OK. I didn't hear it. OK. Yes. Thanks. Ar Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, item. We're going to hop around a little here. Uh, everybody will just hang on and watch carefully. Uh, we're going to go next to 5.1, which is a, uh, a contract we'd like to get done so we can start paving some streets. So 5.1 is pavement, fire, EOC, transit, capital improvements. 
local streets resurfacing number two project. There's no presentation, but John is here and happy to answer your question. I'll move approval. Second. Second. Okay. Are there any questions from my colleagues? How about from the public? Looks like we got a hand. Blair. All right, thank you. Um, I guess this is a time to kind of uh, just thank yourselves for uh, just what Measure T has been doing for the city of San Jose and these repaving issues. Uh, it, it's answering some questions very well for yourselves. Uh, I have been attending uh, City of Berkeley City Council meetings lately. They're just starting to go through the same process of they really have uh, resurfacing issues with their streets. They're thinking of starting uh, bond issues up for it. And they're questioning if they should have something like a Measure T public oversight process, uh, like what we have here in San Jose, as a way to kind of safeguard and to monitor how the entire process is going. Uh, it was a very important matter to have the public oversight committee. And I, I thank you immensely for it. I think it's, a, it's an important uh, uh, committee to have, commission to have. And you know they've been asking how they can better connect with the community. And I've described, I have always have had hopes that this could be a, a sort of oversight committee that could uh, delve into uh, questions of technology surveillance and uh, you know that will be a part of the some some of these street projects and how you know the technology will be a part and how we can have open community conversations on, on the technology issues involved. And if nothing else, you know, all the open public policies and good practices around uh, the future of uh, technology and, and data public policies and its accountability, it can allow what Measure T is asking for this time, where uh, the oversight board, and that, that they want a, a, a more accessible open public process. That the work I'm doing with, with technology accessibility and its guidelines can really help in that process. I mean, uh, the work I do has, has a number of ways that can help community and uh, good luck with the Measure T Oversight Committee and, and all the Measure T practices. Back to council. All right, thank you. Was there a motion? I'm sorry. No, nope, there was. All right, let's yeah. vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, we got another contract and that's item 6.1, which is report on bids and award for the Alviso main replacement project. Uh, there's no presentation. Let's go to the public. There are no hands. Okay. Back to council. Is there a motion or a comment? So move. Second. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. My understanding is we've already deferred the uh, the interview. Is that right, uh, Tony? We have not officially, but we did put, we did contact the interviewee. He is available next week. All right. We have not officially. Okay. Um, let's go on then to and item. He, he is on if you wanted to do it. I'm a little concerned since we have a time limitation. I whether understand. We, yeah, if there are extended discussions, we'd have okay. to cut them off. So what, why don't we um, why don't we go forward with item three point four, okay. which is infant formula, and there is a presentation. Good, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager, um, and here to give a provide a verbal update on the referral that we uh, on, the, on the direction that we received uh, during last month's uh, city roadmap uh, update. Uh, we were asked to reach out to the county 
and, uh, and, and ask them to take a look at report uh, on the availability of infant formula in San Jose. Uh, secondly, to uh, ask them to explore the establishing a regional state of emergency to include the infant formula shortage, similar to New York City's state of emergency. Uh, and to report back to council on, on any legal challenges uh, to implementation. And thirdly, to request the county's uh, consumer protection agency to establish a family friendly formula pledge with local retailers, grocery stores and businesses to commit to the manufacturer, um, suggested retail price and to prevent price gouging. Uh, so we, we've done just that. Um, a lot of traction on these issues. I'll start first with <clears throat> the status of infant formula. Um, you know, th there is no single place to kind of go get this information. So uh, together with the county, we did a cursory review of the impact of, of this crisis on San Jose. Uh, and, and we know that nationally, over 40% of large retailers were out of stock. Uh, some states even reported 73% uh, uh, of um, of, of need in, in their respective communities. Uh, in San Jose, we, we basically reached out to the major chains, uh, either by phone or we visited them um, to, to assess the availability of formula. And uh, approximately 60% of them had either no formula or just very minimal uh, uh, formula on their shelves. Um, we, what we also uh, did was we kind of reached out to some of these larger retailers to also ask and assess, are things getting better, worse, staying the same, and so forth. And what, what most reported to us is that over time, they, they are seeing increases in, in shipments to their stores. And, so, and they expect that to increase over the next few weeks. At the same time, uh, we also know that, uh, that Abbott Laboratories uh, brought their site back online on June 4th, uh, and that's pretty significant. And, and, and in the last few weeks, we also know that they, uh, they pivoted and, and took their Columbus, Ohio plant and really prioritized the production of formula at that location. Uh, Abbott did place a high priority and emphasis on, on producing Alicare, which is an amino-based formula for kids that, that uh, can't process hydrolyzed protein. Uh, as well as uh, an infant formula called Elementum uh, for protein and colic sensitive infants and metabolic formulas for infants with metabolic disorders. Um, we also reached out to the local hospitals and they have been receiving uh, uh, increased uh, uh, supply from the federal government. Uh, of course, uh, nurseries are uh, prioritized in terms of this distribution. Uh, but uh, uh, parents who also need access to formula can also uh, either receive uh, this formula from their local hospitals and or they're referred um, for, for supply. Um, in addition to that, uh, San Jose's own Mother's Milk Bank, uh, which is the oldest operating milk bank in North, North America and is located right here in our own community, has really stepped up in a really big way. And uh, many of you know the milk bank was founded uh, here in San Jose and really focuses on, on, uh, on deploying uh, human milk need, uh, non-prescription based human milk need for premature infants. Um, so things do appear to get, appear to be getting better from a, from a supply standpoint, although we're not out of the woods yet. Um, Abbott reports that uh, it, it's gonna take him a few weeks to, to, for us to really see uh, significant increases, uh, and they're projecting that by the week of June 20th, uh, the, the, uh, we'll see a, a pretty radical difference in terms of the availability of formula. Uh, secondly, with respect to the uh, declaration of a state of emergency, so just today, uh, the county uh, board of supervisors approved the strengthening of the county civil protection and emergency management ordinance uh, to enable uh, pursuit and punishment of predatory price gouging of infant formula uh, during this uh, supply chain shortage. This really mirrors the New York uh, model as well. Um, so they, they just took that action today. Um, it was approved. Um, the Board of Supervisors also directed administration uh, to uh, continue coordination with uh, our city 
uh, especially as it relates to getting the word out uh, to families in need. Uh, they also, in that same motion, also approved um, a grant to Mother's Milk Bank to facilitate provision of donor milk uh, to infants without a prescription. And they also gave direction to their staff to partner with First Five to support their current efforts to collect and distribute uh, donated formula. Um, and so they, they did uh, adopt that emergency ordinance today. They, they amended their current urgency um, ordinance in that clause, and uh, that's effective as of today. And that will last up until uh, the crisis ends. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, the issue around um, preventing price gouging. The ordinance that they adopted specifically calls out uh, price gouging and really stiffens uh, the county's ability, or not stiffens, it, it, it helps facilitate the county's ability to, to levy stiff um, uh, penalties on those that, uh, that price gouge. Um, and that direction there then kind of leads to kind of the third point in, in our direction around a family-friendly uh, pledge. Um, that ordinance, according to the county, will enable their county pr protection agency to basically monitor for price gouging and do what they need to do to, uh, to prevent that. Uh, they're also gonna be exploring uh, a, a pledge, although uh, the direction stopped short of specifically directing them to do that. Uh, but they are uh, considering that based on my conversations uh, with the county. Um, so those are the three uh, steps that have been taken. The county was, uh, was very quick in responding uh, to, to the information that we put forward um, I, I believe Council Member uh, Adenis, who also advanced the uh, memo, uh, was um, also reached out to her uh, colleagues over at the Board of Supervisors. I, I reached out to members of uh, the county execs team and in the department. And I think collectively, we've, um, we're, we're doing some real good coordination and collaboration around this issue. So that is the latest update on, on uh, the infant formula crisis. Thank you, Angel. Um, we'll now go to public comments. Dana. Um, good afternoon, um, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Dana Bennett. I'm Executive Director of Kids in Common. And um, just wanted to express our support for um, Council Member uh, Marenes' memo on 523. Um, you know, if, if we're to be a healthy community, we have to make sure our families and children have those basic necessities met. I really appreciate the update from um, Angel, Angel and um, encourage us to continue in its efforts to address this crisis. Thank you. Marisol. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for providing this platform. My name is Marisol Barajona. I am the program supervisor with Catholic Charities in the Seven Trees community. We've been providing families with essential resources throughout the entire pandemic. Um, and one of those important resources has been baby formula. We've served uh, 1,700 uh, families last year just with formula, and the need continues to grow. Um, unfortunately, our communities are now facing a crisis due to the formula shortage um, throughout the state. Um, and some have even gone to the extent of traveling to various vendors throughout the neighboring cities just to find a can or two. And this doesn't even include the infants that require special formula due to the dietary restrictions. Uh, another point I would like to highlight is that caregivers mostly rely on familiar brands like Similac or Infamil. And with the several recalls uh, across these brands, the shortage and the demand continues. So um, also it's challenging for caregivers to try unfamiliar brands. And we also need to spread awareness of the different brands available um, within the markets. Um, families have expressed their struggle with trying to find the formula that their child needs. So something does need to be done because our most vulnerable participants are just being severely affected. So we have to gather our resources in order to meet their essential needs. Thank you so much for your time. Egypt. Hello, my name is Egypt Shiana Lundy, and I represent the African American Community Service Agency, and I am a policy and advocacy intern. I wanted to completely voice my opinion on these efforts and regards to the state of emergency to address the 
for the formula shortage since our organization provides resources as formula to our community. We as an organization are committed to the child well-being and we have witnessed firsthand how this issue affects low-income communities and parents who rely on women, infant, and children nutrition assistance programs and how these types of formulas are not being able to be accessed. I ask you to remind yourself to take care of our infants and make sure that we lead with care when it comes to this issue. Thank you very much. Have a great one. Bridget. Good afternoon. My name is Bridget Balahaja. I'm the program director for parish engagement at Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. Um, I really appreciate the update on this. I think it's super important as part of our work, we, as the name would suggest, work out of Catholic parishes, namely Our Lady of Refuge, which is in Eastside San Jose. Um, and we've been seeing an average of about 15 to 20 mothers coming in for formula support every week. Uh, most of these mothers are undocumented. Most of these mothers don't speak English and need a lot of support in accessing resources. They're not necessarily aware of the help that's around. Parishes are trusted spaces where people do not feel targeted and feel like they can access the resources that they need to support their children. I can't think of anything more important, especially as a mother of two young children myself, than feeding our babies. Um, and I know the anxiety that a lot of these women feel when they're confronted with the issue of having to figure out how they're going to pay for rent or pay for food, let alone find food for their children. Um, so thank you for bringing this up. I do hope that we will continue to support those most vulnerable in our community, um, especially our babies. Thank you. Becca. Hello, council members. Thank you for having me today. I am a community organizer with Planned Parenthood Marmonte, the local affiliate that serves uh, San Jose. Uh, first, I just want to share a special thank you to Council Member Arenas for raising this really important memo right now. Uh, Planned Parenthood Marmonte provides primary care to patients, including pre and postnatal care, and that's why we understand how vital, affordable, and accessible infant formula is to the health and well-being of not only the patients that we see in our health centers, but any and all the families within our community. And as many of us know, the cost of living has already become unbearable for so many families here, and now they are being price gouged just to feed their babies. And we, we just really can't let parents and caregivers and children suffer like this. And that's why Planned Parenthood Marmonte fully supports this memorandum, which provides innovative and strategic actions to address this crisis swiftly and with care. And I'm also really relieved to hear that the county's recent actions regarding this issue are also in support. And I very much look forward to having the support from the rest of the council as you have all been longtime supporters of health and wellness of San Jose and its residents. So thank you for your time. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thank you. Interesting that a uh, report from Angel Rios, thank you. Uh, interesting that he reported that civil protections are a part of uh, these issues of the county to you know, in ensure that there won't be price gouging going on for this issue. And um, an interesting use of civil protection ideas. Thank you for that understanding. And uh, good luck on these uh, food security issues that I wish we weren't at war with Russia about, and I wish Russia didn't go to war. I wish they could have, I think we could have been at the same negotiation table with ideas of peace and, and how to negotiate, you know, all sides of the Ukraine issue uh, without having to go to war. I think we could have done that. I think it could have worked. And uh, I'm sorry that we're in this space in this in this state. And it's from that, that, you know, I mean, Russia has created kind of a food security problem at this time. We really got to watch the US and how they act and work with food security measures themselves. They can be a little persnickety and a bit, they can make things uncomfortable themselves. And I, it's sad that that happens and that we're in the space that we're in. Good luck on how we can work on this and really, really just be considering our better peaceful good reasoning to resolve these sort of issues. And there is a good reasoning there. We can address it. We just have to be open to want to address it. And good luck how we can do that. And good luck on how to solve these issues. And 
protection to to mothers and and so people don't get robbed and uh thank you for your time tim Mayor and council members, Tim James, California Grocers Association. Uh, we appreciate the ability to comment on the infant formula situation. The reduced availability understandably raises concern and compassion for parents and families. We both serve those families in different capacities and both take our responsibilities very seriously. Um, we provided some specific information regarding the situation writing, um, but there's some additional key points I wanna review. The current challenge is plain and simply a supply issue. There's a well-documented failure at the manufacturing level, which has rippled through the supply chain, impacting both consumers and grocers negatively. Across California, while supply is reduced, infant formula is regularly available. We are in much better shape than most other US states. And this is due to responsible decisions and actions taken by the state of California and diligence from the grocery industry to acquire and move infant formula as quickly as possible. The quota rates by staff do not match current availability. And we have confirmed that major grocers in San Jose were not contacted for information regarding the availability. We are more than willing as an industry and as individual companies to share with the city and your offices the on the ground realities and challenges. We are also hopeful recent actions to restore manufacturing capacity at the federal level means we're currently emerging from this challenge. We ask the city to actively engage the grocery industry to fully understand and respond to the supply chain issues before recommending or implementing other mechanisms. We welcome genuine collaboration from the city and look forward to mutually identifying supply chain solutions. I will remain on the call in case anyone has questions for the industry. Thank you for your consideration. Back to the council. Thank you. All right, back to the council. Council member Arenas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank all of the, the speakers for um, supporting our families. One, for, for speaking today about this issue and, and bringing it to light, but also uh, for supporting our families, not only through this challenge, but the many challenges that have been brought on by um, this pandemic and all the struggles that um, fall in line with the pandemic and loss of job and housing um, and just basic needs. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and for the advocacy that you do. Um, I I did connect with our county um, counterparts and um, learned that there was also the ordinance code, I think as Angel um, reported earlier, they made sure to amend the ordinance code um, that prohibited uh, price gouging um, for the duration uh, of the state of emergency. Um, and so then we're going to be able to have that available to us. And so one of the things that the county is looking for from us is uh, to collaborate on how to get this information out. And so my question is, could we send out an email or through a newsletter um, to all of our businesses that are um, either grocers or liquor stores or anybody who, uh, any of the licensed uh, uh, businesses that uh, deal with food, could we send them a notice about this protection, this um, reinstatement of, of this price gouging ordinance? So Council Member Arenas, um, I, I did actually have that conversation briefly with uh, with the county and, you know, the, at, at that point that was, you know, prior to today's uh, Board of Supervisors vote. And so the thinking was that once this ordinance, uh, you know, uh, if passed and we know it passed now, um, one of the first steps would basically be working with their uh, Office of, of Consumer Protection to really look at what are the immediate actions that they can take uh, with respect to this. And I would, I would imagine that that, uh, that would be a one good option. I will definitely convey that to them. I am meeting with the county tomorrow because we anticipated 
you know, the update to our council today and then their board, their board of supervisor action as well. And so we actually have a meeting on the books to, to kind of do a deeper dive on some next steps, but I, I will be sure to uh, reiterate that. Sure. And I'm, I'm going to assume that they're going to also, um, send the message out, uh, relay this message throughout their own network, but I'm wondering about our network of businesses and how do we get the word out? Yes, we can also explore that. Uh, we haven't worked out those details yet, but I'm sure we can also uh, do that. Um, you know, we're, you know, our, our, our preliminary thinking is, is really reaching out on, on with that message to San Jose businesses and doing that ideally in coordination with the county since they, they have access to um, you know, all, all those businesses. And then secondly, or, or on a parallel track, reaching out to, to just families to get the word out in terms of all the various mechanisms and ways that they can access uh, infant care formula, given that you know, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the increase in supply is starting to trickle up, uh, but we still know that there's still Mm -hmm. I'm sure many in our community that still don't have access to that information. And yeah. so we really want to kind of hit that part very strong with, mm -hmm. with some of our, our partners on the ground. So two yeah. messages, two tracks. Yeah. Um, well, well, that's, that's great. I just, I wonder if um, when we have um, information for our businesses, whether it's grants, whether it's a new ordinance that we just want to um, help facilitate messaging either for the county or for our own selves or for the well-being of, um, of our families out there, that there be a system that we can um, go to um, seeing that we, we are uh, a point of where uh, folks need to receive a, um, sorry, a, a license. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything that we can, I, I know you haven't moved in that direction. I'm just in general, I think that we should have something uh, set up so that we can continue to provide information in a very orderly way. Um, and that is not you know, really inconvenient that it's, I'm sure it's not a push of a button. No, I'm not going to pretend it's that easy, but that we have the system already set. And so from here on, we can always provide information out to our uh, businesses in, um, in an efficient way. Um, the, the other question I have is, would you work with the office of the uh, public information officer so that um, and I'm guessing that you're going to do this with um, the second direction that the county had um, and their um, want to uh, collaborate with us to to disseminate some of this information. Um, were you thinking about including the PIOs in, in this effort? Absolutely. In fact, um, we've already had an internal conversation with our own PIO. Uh, in anticipation of this and in, and uh, also in, in, in follow up to some previous conversations we've had coordination conversations we've had with the county. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're clear on kind of the messaging and that we're very strategic uh, as the county kind of launches their public information effort that ours uh, is, is, is on track with their messaging. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll definitely hit San Jose super hard, right? And so, yes, the answer is a yes, and uh, that's gonna be one of our first steps. Right, and and we might need to include some health uh, messaging that we're not used to. You know, for example, um, some uh, families might um, use uh, milk uh, sooner than, than uh, an infant is ready to use and, and create more issues than solve the problem. And so I, I think that the county's already thinking about this. Um, and uh, this is slightly different than what we're used to providing in terms of information, but I think it's just as um, important in terms of feeding. We distribute food. This is another food source and we need to make sure that we um, collaborate and we provide um, the correct information. Uh, so I'm glad to hear, I already knew that you were collaborating, Angel. I, I expected that because you are just that person um, to do that kind of work. Um, so I, I'm glad that we're um, on the same page in terms of collaboration or sending notices or the messaging. I would love to see um, maybe some uh, radio ads, um, some of the, the things that really worked 
Um, and even though we might have an increase in um, or have a better inventory than other states, the those folks who are going to our first five um, resource centers um, and who are relying from our uh, our contribution, the city's contribution, and my colleagues all approve this. Um, the the distri the distribution of formula from their resource centers, they're going to exhaust that inventory at the end of June. And so we'll find more families that are relying on this network and that and that network will be exhausted in June. And so I think that we need to take an extra step um, and get ahead of this instead of after the fact, no, knowing that this this uh, funding will end. Yeah, and along those lines, council member, uh, you know, you know, the city does, we do have an RFP out on the streets right now. It actually closes this Friday and we're also encouraging organizations to apply uh, for those who, because infant formula of course falls into that food category. Um, and, and this is part of, I just kind of want to re re remind uh, the, the council that this is part of the kind of the transition plan to the county. Uh, we issued an RFP to kind of just kind of keep kind of the momentum going and the support safety net around food distribution that we've created during the pandemic. Uh, effective July 1, this will shift over to the county. Uh, but, but nonetheless, our, as, as you're saying today, I think our, our desire to collaborate and coordinate with the county to address this very important issue will remain the same and it'll continue. Um, but uh, that RFP, we are encouraging nonprofit providers and any, any, anybody who is interested in applying for those funds uh, and who has access to uh, serving kids or children, infants in this case, uh, to apply. And so we, we are putting that word out as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, do you think that the, the baby formula will be separate from the regular food distribution? They might have to be very exclusive. Yeah, well, right now we're including it as, as, as one of the eligible categories. So we, we left the, the, the criteria oh, okay. pretty broad uh, mm -hmm. But as, as you know, during the pandemic, uh, the city, we, we funded to the tune of $2.5 million, uh, mm -hmm. specifically in the area of infant care, of formula and diapers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, I don't think any other jurisdiction has, has, uh, has invested that level. And we saw that early on because, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, uh, of course, supply chain hit infant formula. And so we jumped on that right away, not to the extent that it did this last time this, or this more recent time. But then the second piece was access to diapers and wipes and, and other uh, essentials, right? And we were one of the first cities, uh, actually the first city, to really work with FEMA and the government to actually have them recognize infant care uh, support uh, during a pandemic because it actually wasn't in the books, uh, just as a little trivia piece, little pandemic trivia piece. Um, well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate um, the information. Um, when does that RFP um, end? When does that it close? Yeah, that, that closes um, this Friday is, is when it closes. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're leaving some flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, how we end date the term of that agreement. You know, there's some uh, food providers that may need, you know, more money up front for a shorter amount of time. There's others that may want to take that money and spread it out over the course of the year. We're trying not to put too many constraints on it. Uh, and, and be as nimble and flexible as we can, uh, mm -hmm. again, with an eye towards transitioning this and helping to facilitate this uh, back over to the county. Great, wonderful. So when will you return to provide us um, all of the information? Um, will you do an information memo or will you come back and do an update? Uh, you, you know, uh, council member, if, if, you know, perhaps you could give us that flexibility to either come back and provide another update like this, or perhaps do that via info memo, if, if that's more streamlined, um, you know, sure. based on the actions that were taken. But uh, I think either one of those two uh, would, would definitely be, uh, be worth doing. Okay, what, wonderful. Well, um, thank you. I, um, I, I would uh, be open to either one. Thank you. Those are my comments. Okay, other comments, my colleagues? Council Member, I have my hand raised. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I wanted to follow up. Uh, obviously, I agree this is something we started earlier during the pandemic um, of getting formula out, and then you add this shortage along with 
what everybody's going through and inflation, I think it's huge. Um, I had a question going back to Operation Fly Formula. Angel, are, are we coordinating with Cal OES on the shipment that's coming in this Saturday to California? So, so, we, so we are, we are, um, we, we are reaching out to Cal OES. Um, uh, we, we predominantly are getting uh, referred back to local hospitals because uh, each of the, the local hospitals are actually coordinating directly with that operation. And especially since they're the recipient of that, they're, they're, they're the primary recipient of that supply. And then hospitals have informed us that they're focusing on uh, you know, premature babies, uh, kids that have uh, some type of um, an allergy or some need some type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people that cannot tolerate hydrolyzed protein uh, or have some kind of metabolic disorder. Those are the priorities. But, on t but after that, they're also uh, uh, receiving, you know, the more traditional formula. And the way this works is that first and foremost, newborns uh, are, are the first recipients of these supplies followed by uh, you can reach out to your hospital and request the need that you have and they'll either accommodate that need based on their supply or give you a voucher to WIC or to another supplier or direct you to somebody who has it um, and uh, and so far that seems to be addressing the need and 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 frankly what we're also seeing and hearing a lot from a lot of neighborhoods is just uh, kind of like you know, for lack of a better term, you know, securing, you know, infant care, uh, infant formula a la Mary Kay, right? You call seven people and seven people call seven people and they find two or three, you know, uh, and that's exactly uh, w what a lot of people are, are doing uh, during this crisis. And so we're hoping that right around June 20th, based on the, based on the projections that, that Abbott is making uh, and, and based on what retailers are telling us, uh, that we'll see uh, a, a more significant increase or availability of formula of all types. The other thing I, I, I failed to mention earlier is that when we reached out to WIC, they also relaxed some of their criteria and that they're also providing vouchers to purchase with WIC um, subsidies, other forms of formula, not just those that are, that are typically kind of confined to, to what they use. Uh, and one of the other things that we also learned as we were doing this research is that uh, Abbott also has a, Abbott Laboratories also has a um, plant in Ireland that was focused almost exclusively on some of those harder to get infant formulas for uh, high need babies. Uh, and that uh, they pivoted to, to, towards that pretty quickly uh, when this crisis hit. Um, so all, all those things collectively are making a big difference. Um, and then that coupled with, I think, the county's actions today to really uh, strengthen their ordinance uh, to send a very strong message against uh, price gouging, um, I think, uh, is, is, is a, a good step in, in the right direction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really helpful. I, I, I will say that in my district, um, I have seen that, that Mary Kay, I'm going to steal your term now. I have seen it where, you know, people call different people or get in a chat group and ask. But again, the folks who are the most vulnerable, the people that have to take three buses to, you know, go to a store with the baby and, um, you know, they're, they're in the toughest spot, right? They can't hop in a car and drive out to multiple locations or, pay a little bit more a lot more for formula and um so uh so i know that there's a lot to balance here um and i also wanted to amplify some of the comments around consistency in formula that it really is important to not bounce around from one type to another um so that if we can offer that consistency locally i think that's important um all right i'll stop there thank you all right. Uh, Councilmember Rennes, did you, you had your hand up. Is that from before? Oh, yeah, it, it was. But, you know, motion to accept the report. Okay. Second. And there's, there's a motion and a second. All right. There are no other comments. Let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arena? <coughs> yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye.
Thank you. Okay, we're going to defer the remaining items uh, until next week, or if there's another date that the Rules Committee so determines. Uh, and we'll go to public comment. Javier? Ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman Remain. So just one question about the charter charter item. There, there's no issue as it relates to getting that on the ballot. Uh, I'm thinking about the deadlines. And stuff. No, the deadline's we, August. Yeah, it's August. Cool. We brought okay. it early. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. You don't, you don't like it inside out, huh? Good afternoon. My name is Javier Hernandez, and I'm here today to ask you for your help and support because uh, everybody knows that uh, global warming is getting out of control and it's getting out of hand. We can see it every day, you know, for the radical effects on the weather. You know, where when rains, it pours, you know, and got a, a lot of disasters, you know, because of that. We have uh, hurricanes and we have a, a lot of radical events on the weather. So, the I'm asking you for your help and support to, to develop a plan to get a plan rolling, you know, like a, I mentioned on my, on my sign, you know, install one solar system on every roof. If you drive any, any uh, neighborhood, you're gonna see a lot of empty, empty roofs, residential and commercial. And that, that can be uh, one part of the solution of the problem that we, that, that we can uh, encounter, you know, can we with an attack to an, an, a, an a solid form to start um, uh, solving the, I mean, try to solve uh, the, the problem of the, of the uh, global warming. Thank you. And I, I, I don't know if you've been seeing. Thank you. Your time is up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. The sign said it all. <laughs> Mayor, if I could, if I could yeah. be uh, marked as an I vote on item 3.4. I was in the back, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, I think I wanted to offer, uh, you know, it was, it was nice to hear the words of the previous speaker. Uh, I'm considering, you know, we have an important commitment in the state of California on this election day. Uh, the state of California has made some really interesting decisions about how to proceed with the future of uh, uh, the, the balance between uh, renewables and uh, frac fossil fuel use in our future. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, fossil fuel use may be needed for the future of, of renewable plans at this time. Yet California has developed a way to not like celebrate the that 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 relationship, but really modify the use of what will be the future of fossil fuels uh, in this country, and that they're creating a very uh, interesting plan to do that. So it isn't a, a case of another generation of fracked fuels running higgly piggly uh, around the whole system. Um, 
so it's an interesting ways to be working and we need to talk about these ways more because it was mentioned at a lot at the uh, meeting yesterday on, on transportation about the future of carbon neutral practices that um, just signify the needs of uh, nuclear use. And I think there's a real question and concern and debate about the future of renewables versus carbon neutral ideas. And we need to have that open discussion more often here now. And the people who work really well with renewable ideas really need to make clear what we, how we can be working towards a renewable future and to question the future of nuclear. Uh, as much as carbon neutral is important, we have to question nuclear. That's my feeling. Thank you. Sindhu? I thank the council for its time today. Um, I would, however, um, request for further outreach um, to deter to help residents determine how they can be involved in um, helping the city redesign its program for waste management. Um, we heard some comments about uh, how there were fixed costs for garbage pickup and how there's contamination. There are residents that are willing to work with other residents to fix these issues. And there is always the option of saying, I only want my garbage picked up once a month or even less, or just have organic waste picked up every week and nothing else. So there, there are ways around this. This program must be redesigned. I urge council to consider it very seriously so that raising rates on everything is not the only option we always consider. I thank you very much for your time and consideration. Giovanni. Hi, I just wanted to add to what was being said earlier about uh, what was going on yesterday, how they're, they're trying to eliminate fracking and fossil fuels. I think that when they said they wanted to lead the way in being purely electric, that it doesn't really sound like a good idea on the environment. It sounds like a burden to the environment and on, on like middle-class people like myself. So I think we need to figure out a way to lead the way in actually like learning how to have a good balance of it and being fair instead of eliminating it as we're adding to the good plans. Also, I, I was on another note, I was wanted to recommend maybe some type of a plan for water because we always have droughts and we live by the bay and the ocean. I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's any ways to like come up with an idea of some sort of a pipe to bring water to us whenever we need it the most. Uh, other than that, uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you for your time. Jill Border. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to quickly um, throw something out there. I don't know where to find the information. I guess I'll try to maybe type out to the city clerk. But um, the question is, it was mentioned earlier with all of these things when the city clerk was reading off, this is, you know, 1% of the people of the protests um, does not, you know, then make it so that we could, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, so that we could, you know, address it or whatever, so you can vote on it. And so I've never heard that, what is the threshold and, and where would we find something like that out? Is it, okay, there's 5% of, you know, protests there, you know, what what would then warrant um, you guys not being able to approve it? I, I didn't hear that that raised. And I don't know whether that's something that comes in a letter in the mail. And because I live in a mobile home park, we don't receive that information, but I wouldn't have even known that um, my protest would actually then trigger um, uh, something where then you would not be able to approve it. So anyway, those are the little kind of things that come up that I, that I say, oh, well, if people knew that, maybe there would have been more outreach um, for people to show up in a higher percentage and then hitting that trigger. So those are the little kind of things I'd love to be able to figure out about, you know, city government that I have trouble understanding and just thought I'd throw it out there. Thanks. Brian? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, I, if I could recommend something, the, uh, the speech by Matthew McConaughey today about gun control and what happened um, in Texas, would I highly recommend it. Um, he, uh, there, there was a showing the divide as he was leaving after he had given an impassioned speech. One of the people from one of the news organizations said, are you grandstanding? And this news organization I won't mention 
it, it has a max in its name though. And it, our species isn't gonna make it if we don't stop doing that. You know, we're not. And, and like I've said before, my name ends with my, I don't have kids, so my name ends with me. And, but a lot of you guys, ladies and gentlemen have kids and the people listening have kids. Their grandkids may, may not make it as a species. I mean, as an entire species, if we don't try to find a way to work together, we, we do at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, at the global level. And um, we, we've managed to mitigate since we've evolved from the caves out to here, we've managed to mitigate to some degree, some of the worst things that plague our species. And we're even fighting against those now. We're fighting against vaccines that have saved literally billions of lives, billions of lives. And there are people that, that do not care about, that, absolutely do not care about that. And that should trouble us. I'm not sure why it doesn't, but it should. Thank you. Back to the council. Okay, the meeting's adjourned. All right. Let's go out and raise a flag. Okay.